Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Lifecycle Assessment Tools for Environmental Biotechnology uh, session. This workshop is the first workshop of the series of workshop we'll be holding on process integration and uh, sustainability assessment working group for the Environmental Biotechnology Network. If you're not familiar with Environmental Biotechnology Network, it is a uh, NIB, which is Networks in Industrial Biotechnology and Bioenergy, um, funded by BBSRC and EPSRC of the UKRA, primarily BBSRC funding. Um, and this uh, network is to uh, create and bring together a leading community in environmental biotechnology uh, and bringing industrial and academic partners together to make them work in this field. Uh, to in order to lead the field in the world. So today we aim to focus on life cycle assessment tools, how to define an environmental biotechnology problem to do uh, a life cycle assessment and how life cycle assessment results can be used in decision making on environmental biotechnology problems. Our imminent speakers uh, for today are Dr. Uh, James Joyce from Unilever, uh, Dr. Adrian Higson from NNFCC, and Dr. Siddharth Gadkari from the University of Surrey. Now I'm going to introduce uh, James um, to be the first speaker. Dr. James Joyce is a sustainability scientist at Unilever Safety and Environmental Assurance Center, where he supports the program on the development and business application of environmental sustainability science. James is an expert in life cycle assessment and related approaches and their commercial applications. Prior to joining Unilever in 2020, James had over 10 years of experience in this area, including as a product sustainability consultant and during his PhD and postdoctoral research. Thank you very much, James, for joining today afternoon, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Over to you, James, the virtual flow. Wonderful, thank you, Juma. Let me just uh, share my presentation and we can make a start. We could see, okay. it, see your presentation. Fantastic, brilliant. All right then, uh, so hello everyone. I'm, as, I'm James Joyce, as Juma said, I'm a sustainability scientist at Unilever in our Safety and Environmental Assurance Centre. Uh, and I'll be talking to you today from, uh, from Chile, Milton Keynes, about uh, the ways that we apply life cycle assessment and related approaches uh, to the decision making that we do uh, and the things that we support here at Unilever. So starting off uh, with a bit about Unilever itself, um, for those of you who, who don't recognise the name, we are one of the world's largest fast moving consumer goods companies. Uh, and if you don't know the name Unilever, there's a strong possibility that you recognize uh, one of our over 400 brands. Um, that's just a few examples for you there. Brands like Dove, Axe, which is also known as Lynx here in the UK, Hellman's, uh, and we, we operate across five main areas. Uh, so we've got our nutrition business, brands like Nora and Hellman's. Uh, we've got ice cream, so that's the Heart brand ice cream walls here in the UK, other names in various other countries, uh, Breyers and other brands in the US, um, as well as Ben and Jerry's. Uh, then we have our home care uh, portfolio, which is uh, primarily Purcell and Surf here in the UK. Uh, with the various other brands under similar banners uh, elsewhere in the world. Um, then we have our personal care and our beauty and uh, well-being brands as well. So that's where, where Love & Co fit in. Uh, and we have absolutely enormous reach with all of these products. We estimate that around 3.4 billion people use our products every day. So there's probably a roughly a one in three chance that each one of you has used the Unilever product uh, at some point today. Um, and we're available in over 190 countries, so uh, an absolutely uh, massive opportunity to to influence what we do through the work that we do within CIAC. Uh, 
worth noting that about 58%, nearly 60% of our turnover is in emerging markets. Uh, so we're not just for um, developed countries. Uh, there's a lot of our products going out to places like India, China, um, Brazil. Um, yeah, and our, our turnover for the most recent financial year in 2021 was was numbering in the in around 52 billion. So with this with this great reach and this um, this enormous footprint, we have a fantastic opportunity to embed sustainability uh, around our products into the lives of lots and lots of people. And this is underpinned by our what we call our compass strategy. Uh, this is uh, where sustainability is integrated right into the core of how we do business at Unilever. Our corporate purpose uh, is to to make sustainability a uh, sustainable living commonplace. Um, and to support that, we have uh, our our compass commitments. Um, and these fall into three main pillars. Uh, the first is around improving the health of the planet. The next is around improving people's health and well-being. Uh, and there's a third pillar around contributing to a more uh, socially inclusive world. Uh, the work that I do in, in SEAC is on the environmental sustainability side. So it's mainly supporting that first pillar around improving the health of the planet. And there's a couple of key targets which I'd like to, to pick out from the ones that we've got in our commitments here. Uh, the first is we've committed to be net zero uh, across scope one, two and three up to the point of sale uh, by 2039. Uh, and we've also continued our commitment that we uh, have had since 2010 to halve the greenhouse gas impact of our, our products across their life cycle by 2030. And as you can imagine, for these two targets in particular, uh, life cycle assessment and life cycle science really uh, is, is a useful tool. Now, as you can imagine, with a company that size, uh, there's lots and lots of uh, people working for Unilever as a massive ecosystem. So where do we fit in in this sort of 3D jigsaw puzzle? We sit in uh, SIAC, uh, which is short for the Safety and Environmental Assurance Center. This is part of R&D, but it sits outside of our divisions and brands and acts as a sort of science center to feed in uh, the evidence that we require to ensure that Unilever's innovations and products are safe and sustainable by design. There's around about 100 people in SIAC, uh, split between the safety side and the sustainability side, and there's around 10 people uh, in the sustainability team. Within the sustainability program, there are three main areas where we focus. The first of these is science development, and then we have business support and external engagement. So the science development side is around developing and creating new scientific methods to help support these other two areas, the places we support the business and the places that we work externally. And we don't do this on our own. We do this through creating and developing academic partnerships with a, a range of different universities and other academic partners, uh, including the University of Surrey. Um, in addition to developing methods, we also uh, contribute to development of metrics. So, for example, around biodiversity, where there's likely to be a, an increasing need um, to have uh, quali quantitative metrics uh, from a commercial perspective to really understand the impact that we're having in that area. As I mentioned, this supports these other two areas. So the first of these is the business support, and this can be from a procedural perspective, so helping with greenhouse gas reporting in our annual reports and accounts. Uh, it could be working to provide evidence for robust claims with consumers uh, around claim support, but it also operates at a very strategic level. So guiding the overall strategy and the development of our climate transition action plan, working with the business groups, uh, the categories to, to help guide their, uh, their strategy, but also from the bottom up, working with uh, developers, formulators, research and development to support uh, sustainable product innovation. In addition to this, we have the external part, which is where we bring to bear our science from an advocacy perspective, working with our external affairs teams, but also collaborating uh, with, with peers and collaborative programs. For example, working with the WBCSD as part of their PACT program, that's the Partnership for Action on Climate Transparency, uh, which is around getting together a network to, to share scope three upstream scope three emissions data. Uh, similarly, on the eco-label side, we're working actively with various schemes that are in development um, to really drive forward the science perspective and make sure that the communications that we make through that route in the future around eco-labels are, are robust and grounded in the science of life cycle assessment. So, life cycle assessment, uh, what is it and why do we use it? 
Uh, so life cycle assessment is a way of understanding and managing the potential environmental impacts of a product uh, across its whole life cycle. Uh, we, we tend to, to deal more with environmental life cycle assessment, although things like social life cycle assessment uh, are obviously uh, similar tools, and they use that, that whole life cycle perspective. So what this means is taking into account the, uh, the full life cycle from cradle to grave of a product or a service. This means all the way from the sourcing of the raw materials, the extraction of the raw materials from the planet. That could be agriculture, that could be oil extraction, that could be mining. Then the processing all of these materials all the way through to when we turn them into a product, the delivery of that product to our consumers, the use of that product by our consumers, and then the final disposal of the packaging. Uh, and if, for example, with our personal care and laundry products, uh, the disposal of the, um, of the product as it goes down the drain. Now, at each point in this life cycle, there's the potential for resources to be extracted from the uh, from from the ground, from the planet, uh, and there's potential for emissions either to air or to soil or to water as a result of the processes that take place in this life cycle. And what life cycle assessment is is it's a tool to quantify these flows, quantify these potential impacts in a systematic and scientific manner. Uh, because each of these flows has the potential uh, via various cause or effect mechanisms to, to have an impact on the environment. If we emit greenhouse gases as part of a process, then that has the potential to cause climate change. If we emit nitrogen as runoff to watercourses as a result of some kind of agricultural process, that has the potential to, uh, to cause a eutrophication impact if it reaches a freshwater receptor. And so it's these flows and these pathways that we're assessing holistically when we talk about using life cycle assessment. Now we use it in a number of ways at Unilever, as you can imagine. Uh, so that includes uh, looking at product materials and systems uh, at the innovation level to support innovation in each of those areas. We can also use it at a portfolio level for strategic decision making and that corporate reporting that I spoke about. Uh, and we use it to underpin those communications with consumers. As I mentioned at the start, this is all underpinned by a never emerging field of science in the area, which we're really working hard with our ecosystem partners to, to support. Uh, and so really expanding the frontiers of LCA science. And we'll talk a bit about that uh, in a few of the slides coming up. So starting with how we apply life cycle approaches in innovation and product development. When you're creating a new product, uh, when you're creating new innovation, there is a, a paradox that occurs to do with uh, assessing the environmental impact of that product. And this is to do with the fact that at the beginning of that decision making process, you have lots of options open to you. You have lots of scope for change. So when you're in the early innovation and discovery phases, when you're coming up with a new concept, for example, uh, there's multiple different ways you can go. There's ways you can change your mind. And as you uh, narrow down through that innovation funnel, through to the valuation of the final concepts, through to when you've got a a range of different formulations, for example, that you might want to do development and testing on. And finally, through to when you're locked down to a, a final version that you're going to, uh, to put into production to launch, uh, the latitude for change uh, starts to, uh, to starts to contract um, as you get from that early stage to that later stage. Now, the reverse of this is the availability of the data that you have to do quantitative assessments of the environmental impact of these products. So at the beginning, when it could be anything, you don't tend to have very much uh, in the way of data. You certainly won't have any primary data because you don't have a system that you can operate on. Uh, you'll have some thoughts and some concepts and that will be uh, that'll be the limit of the data available to you. Now, as you as you narrow in on that innovation funnel towards your final product, obviously the data that you have available to you to, to assess uh, becomes, uh, becomes greater. And so you've got an actual final product in market where you have, in theory, every all of the spec data, all of the activity data that you need to run uh, full kind of life cycle assessments. So how do we solve this paradox? And the answer to this is we need to use the right approaches at the right time and use a range of life cycle approaches, not just looking to full uh, life cycle assessment. So in the early to early days, in the early innovation and discovery times, we can use more qualitative approaches. So this is things like uh, understanding safe and sustainable by design principles uh, and applying life cycle thinking to, uh, to the, the problem statement as it occurs at that early innovation and discovery phase. When it comes to concept evaluation, when you've got a few uh, different options that you might be considering, it's around identifying the potential sort of gross negatives, gross positives, the big 
the big ticket items that might be associated with a particular uh, product innovation. So here we can start to do screening LCAs uh, using assumptions and secondary data uh, on a limited number of impact categories to sort of try and identify where those hotspots might be. Uh, we can use eco-design tools so our formulators can take a look at the potential impact of the, of the things that they're considering. Uh, and we could do sort of semi-quantitative risk assessments to flag up where there may be major hotspots of impact as part of that new innovation. Now, when it comes to the development and testing side, there we have some more options open to us and we have some more things that we might want to consider. So for example, if we're making a really wholesale shift in the way that we're, um, we're making a product, shifting feedstocks, for example, we may want to consider uh, some more broad scale potential impacts. And this is where uh, things like iterative LCA come in, uh, where we're updating the product and we're doing the LCA and we're seeing where we're going and trying to plot our course to do a more sustainable product. And where things like uh, what we call Lucy LCA, so this is land use change improved LCA, uh, one of the, the new methods uh, that uh, SIAC in collaboration with our academic partners has developed, which is looking at what happens when there's a sudden demand shock uh, for a particular agricultural product as a result of a potential change in the way that we are trying to source. Um, so if we're using more bioplastics, if we're using more bio-based materials, uh, there's potentially going to be an increased demand, which could lead to uh, different things that will happen at the scale that we operate at. And so we can use things like that to, to get a much better understanding at that early phase before we lock in that, uh, that final um, development piece. Similarly, uh, with prospective LCA, I'll talk about this again in more detail a little bit later, but this is around making sure that the assumptions that we've made today are still going to be valid in the future, depending on uh, how the, the rest of the background system, how the rest of the, the economy develops uh, and feeds into those impacts that we're having. Finally, once we've got a product out there on the market, uh, we can start looking into supporting environmental claims, taking advantage of the uh, the benefits of the, sorry, of the reductions that we will hopefully have made in the innovation process uh, by communicating that to our customers, uh, the retailers and our consumers. And we can also use it to get a, a greater insight of our portfolio and sort of a, a post hoc perspective when we're doing uh, that reporting. And here is where we get those, uh, those more um, sort of stringent and uh, high data requirement uh, studies, things like full life cycle assessments either done in house or by third parties. Specific assessments for eco labels, for example, uh, but also the more um, qualitative side, supporting the stories for uh, and logos for brand uh, communications. And we'll come on to that again in a little bit more detail later. So at the very beginning of this uh, of this funnel, uh, this is where we see our, our qualitative tools. Uh, and so here is an example. Safe and sustainable by design principles, and we can use these uh, and and other various life cycle thinking approaches to to speak to our innovators, to speak to R and D, uh, and make sure at the outset they're familiar with the the kind of options, the kind of things that they can do to design in at the very outset to to make sure our products are sustainable. Uh, and this includes pointing them towards the more self service stuff like the eco design tools that we have in house at Unilever. On the disruptive innovation side, I mentioned uh, Lucy LCA. Uh, this is uh, some figures from the paper that was published back in 2017 from our research with our partners over at NatCap Natural Capital Project uh, and the University of Minnesota. Uh, and this is a perspective and spatially resolved model uh, that says if we were to, to cause a, an increase in demand, a demand shock in a certain area for a certain agricultural product, what are the, the consequences when it comes down to a product level? Uh, so that requires understanding uh, through this model uh, what that will mean in terms of either extensification of agriculture out into the natural matrix or intensification of agriculture in the existing plots uh, to upscale the yield in order to, to meet that demand. Uh, and we can take that and we can apply the our life cycle assessment to it, understanding the impact associated with the land use change or additional uh, flows of uh, materials such as fertilizers into our system. But play that all through and have a look what it does in terms of the impact of the product and the impact uh, and an aggregate as a result of that change. Uh, it's an extremely powerful uh, and innovative tool uh, that helps us to really bring to bear the, the, the true power of life cycle assessment in those in those decisions, both around innovation, but also around our sourcing options and our, and our deployment strategy for the products where, where this is a big issue. So it's a very, very useful uh, application of life cycle assessment. 
in other parts of the life cycle where we may be causing disruption, we can also uh, apply other approaches to to really understand what's going on. So this is a piece of research um, uh, from Sharma Hamdi et al, a PhD student that came through uh, at SIAC, looking at the effect of different ways of consumers obtaining our products uh, on the, the greenhouse gas impact that is associated with that. So here specifically is looking at the differences between people going to bricks and mortar shops versus what's called bricks and clicks, which is where uh, people are sort of clicking online to, to order stuff that is still being fulfilled by a retail store, uh, all the way through to the full sort of proper e-com stuff where things are being housed at distribution centers and local distribution centers and ending up in consumers' homes. Now here we can see that there's a, a huge amount of variability here and it's this variability that we're really seeking to understand what uh, what makes a difference uh, and how does it vary between these various things. Uh, and we can use this to understand what will happen as a result of our innovation and our deployment strategies and take this into account when we're considering uh, what's overall best to improve the health of the planet. On the claims and communication side, uh, as you'll no doubt have noticed, uh, there's an increasing level of stringency and robustness required by people such as uh, consumer protection agencies and advertising standards agencies, really trying to, to stamp out greenwash uh, when it comes to communicating the environmental benefits of products to consumers. And as a result, there's uh, a need for uh, ensuring that any claims that we make as Unilever are based on robust science that's been uh, stringently and uh, reliably carried out. Uh, and this is part of our role at SIAC, uh, either ourselves or working with selected third parties to ensure that we have the robust evidence to underpin claims that our brands want to make out there uh, in the public arena. These can be claims on PAC. So these are a couple of examples from, uh, from this year. Uh, the top one there is a claim on a pack of ice cream in Sweden. If you don't speak Swedish, it says uh, it's a 30% lower carbon footprint than the previous recipe. Uh, this is because it's a, a plant-based non-dairy ice cream, uh, replacing the dairy protein with plant protein uh, to reduce the overall climate impact of that uh, ice cream without taking away any of the, the lovely flavor of that three flavor uh, big pack ice cream. Um, and the claims don't necessarily have to be on pack. We can use them in, in other communications as well. Uh, so the second example here is uh, the Purcell capsules, which were relaunched this year uh, as Purcell in the UK. There's a, the brand is called Skip over in over on the continent. And the, the capsule itself has been reduced in size. It's gone down from 26 grams to 20 grams uh, through a concentration and reformulation process. And the packaging is no longer made of polypropylene. It's made out of cardboard, uh, which is recyclable. Um, and so on pack, the big the big change for the consumer is the fact that the thing that they're picking up is uh, is now made of cardboard. And that's what's really called out uh, as the messaging there. But in the press release to, to accompany it, uh, there is uh, more detailed information about the, the environmental benefits of the switches that we made there, including a 16% reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions associated uh, with the capsules, uh, which again is underpinned by, by studies undertaken by us at SIAC. The other way we can, can communicate with consumers is around eco-labels. And you'll have noticed an increasing number of uh, schemes where people are trying to, to put onto, onto pack or onto the internet a, a single number that try or a single letter that tries to encapsulate uh, how something rates in terms of its environmental impact. As you can imagine, there's a lot of uh, complicated science and complicated methodology that has to sit behind that to go from something as as detailed and as complex as a as a life cycle assessment, distilling that down to a single rating from A to E or from one to ten or from one to one hundred that means something to a consumer. And so it's really important uh, that when we're considering taking part in these schemes, that we uh, make sure that they're based on that robust science that that underpins everything that we do in sustainability Unilever. So as part of that, we have uh, currently a PhD student working at the University of Surrey, uh, Maylis Quartet, who is working on understanding the underpinning science for eco-labels and developing an objective framework to help with the development of high quality science-based robust schemes in this area. Uh, as you can see in the graphic there, the, the key principles here are relevance, making sure that the consumers can make the, the right type of decision on the basis of the information provided, uh, scientific robustness, transparency and trust is a very key one, as well as feasibility and scalability to make sure that it can be adopted uh, at a broad scale. 
And so when we're working with external schemes, when we're working with people like the Eco Beauty School Consortium uh, or Foundation Earth, uh, providing uh, scientific input, we're we're making sure that through those industry-wide collaborations, we can inject that science, inject that rigor, inject that robustness at the earliest possible stage into the development of those schemes to make sure that when it comes to the communication with consumers, uh, we can be happy that it's based on, on robust and uh, rigorously uh, carried out science. Moving up a level uh, and looking at the sort of more strategic aspects, uh, every year Unilever conducts what we call our annual uh, greenhouse gas footprinting exercise. Now this is where we take a representative sample of our SKUs, our stock keeping units, it's a jargon for products. We take 3000 of our products uh, and we, we do a full uh, greenhouse gas carbon footprint uh, life cycle assessment. Uh, on each of those. Now, these are representative of the various uh, brands and the various business units as a, as a sample of our, of our more than 70,000 products. Uh, there are three main phases. So the first is to extract the business data. So that's sales, how much did we, did we make of this stuff? Uh, what is the specification? And what is the, the consumer habit information for that use phase part uh, for the consumers? This then goes into our footprint calculation phase where we combine that with environmental information. So uh, life cycle inventory data, emissions factors, if you will, uh, to, to work out the carbon footprint of each of those products. Uh, and once we have that, we can aggregate it up and it goes into the inter interpretation and reporting phase uh, and self support the scope three figures that we publish in our annual reports and accounts. Uh, as you can see from this bottom approach, we aggregate up and we can get an insight at various different levels through that aggregation. So we can look at it at a, at a category level, at a country level, at a brand level, all the way up to our, our total global Unilever portfolio. And so in addition to use in external reporting, uh, we can help feed this into our internal innovation tools uh, to help people uh, understand the impact of the innovations they're having but also provide strategic insight, both on the, the current hotspots of impact we have in our portfolio, but using it to predict future impacts. So what happens if we change this about our portfolio? What happens if our markets develop like this? We can we can use the information that we have, this rich library of, of carbon footprint information to really help drive uh, in a sort of data-driven decision-making way, those impacts at a more strategic portfolio level. Finally, as I mentioned, uh, all of this is underpinned by our, our research and development mode, our science and technology development, uh, advancing the frontiers of sustainability science. And this happens across SIAC. Uh, it's not just limited uh, to the sustainability side. There's a, a huge amount of work going on on our safety side as well, particularly around uh, eliminating the use of animals uh, for animal testing uh, when it comes to safety. Uh, if you go to the website there, you can uh, take a look at the various themes which we uh, which we cover with our science development. Uh, and there's a, a full list of our publications there as well. Um, so yeah, but Paul calling out just a couple uh, uh, in these next couple of slides. As I mentioned before, we don't do this alone. We work in an, off, in an ecosystem of, of partners. These could be university partners, uh, people like Surrey. Um, it could be uh, funding PhDs could be funding postdocs, it could be uh, working together on, on grant proposals and, and leveraged funding uh, and providing in-kind support. There's all kinds of options when we're, when we're advancing uh, our LCA science with our academic partners. There's also um, non-academic partners, so consultants, people like Qantas, helping them develop the World Food Lifecycle Database, or 2.0 consultants to help work with the roundtable for sustainable palm oil on developing better uh, greenhouse gas data for palm oil. Uh, and then there's the um, the other external collaborations I mentioned there around eco-labeling, uh, all part of that science ecosystem that can help us really drive forward the underpinning science in this very important area. One of the areas where we're where we're currently developing uh, science is in what we call planetary boundaries LCA. So this is taking a more absolute approach to to sustainability assessments that we're looking at. Um, so planetary boundaries decides the uh, describes what's called a safe operating space for humanity. So this is a floor under above which uh, our well-being needs are supported, as well as a ceiling, which means that we're not overshooting the carrying capacity of our ecosystems and of our natural systems. And the idea is that we need to, to maintain our, our society within this safe operating space in order to be absolutely sustainable uh, for, for the future. Now, when it comes to, to life cycle assessment, uh, this is quite a challenging concept. 
because we're not looking at society as a whole, we're looking at individual products, individual slices of portfolio, individual product systems. And so there's a lot of uh, research looking into how we take the planetary boundaries impact categories and translate them onto life cycle assessment impact categories. And once we've done that, how do we divide up? How do we share that safe operating space? What are the principles there for, uh, for figuring out how we do that? How do we make sure it's spatially and temporally relevant? Uh, is what's relevant in Europe the same as what's relevant in other places in the world, for example? Uh, and this all needs to be underpinned by by robust software and data so that people can do this stuff. So that's an active area of research for us uh, and our academic partners at the minute. Another area we're in, uh, where we're looking at is what we call prospective LCA. So this is making sure that the the inferences and the uh, the conclusions, the decisions we're making today, will still be valid uh, into the future. Now, when you're doing a life cycle assessment, you have what you call your foreground system, which is your, your product system, the thing that you're collecting data for, the thing that you're modeling. And then this is underpinned by the background system, which is a representation of the, the current industrial economy, all of the different flows that flow through it. So this could be electricity grid mixes. This could be production systems for input uh, chemicals and input materials to your process. All of that stuff, usually in big databases like EcoInvent, uh, sits sort of as this unseen bit of the iceberg under, beneath the surface. Then when you're doing scenario assessment, a uh, more forward-looking assessment, uh, it's quite easy to translate that foreground system into the future. Uh, you can see what you're going to be actively changing uh, and make the changes to your model accordingly. It's more difficult, however, to, to make sure that that top of the iceberg doesn't become disjointed from the bottom when you're moving forward in time. And here what you need is database level integration of future scenarios that we can quantify. And uh, so this diagram here on the left hand side. This is from an upcoming paper uh, by Mark Wadatel. This is looking at taking the shared socioeconomic pathway uh, work that's been done, uh, describing various different versions of the future, more sustainable versions, more middle of the road versions, more uh, non-sustainable versions, and applying those to the background data set, uh, projecting it all the way forward year by year out to 2050 and seeing if the uh, conclusions that we make around, in this case, uh, plant-based diets and plant-based meals are still borne out uh, when we look at it in the context of those future background systems. Uh, and again, for this, we need we need software, we need data, uh, software called Futura, uh, which is one of mine that we're developing, um, that can help us to, to make robust uh, and stable conclusions over time. Finally, on these horizons point, the one the one that I want to highlight is data. Data, LCA and uh, related approaches are very data hungry. Um, and in order to, to make sure we have the right uh, conclusions, we need the right data to support it. And while we could go out and collect as much data as we can, there's a very interesting new horizon as uh, as digital techniques and computational techniques start to uh, play more of a part in underpinning life cycle assessment to really dig into that and leverage those new techniques to, to help with our gap filling, help with our life cycle imagery data and help really push that field forward uh, in the absence of the ability to uh, to go out and, and collect more data. This is early stages for us at the minute and we're actually uh, in fact recruiting at the moment for a PhD over in Radboud uh, to do just this. So if you are interested in a new challenge, uh, feel free to scan the QR code there uh, and um, take a look at the, the work that we're planning to do in this very important area. Right, that is about it for me. Just to, to summarize very quickly, uh, so life cycle assessment and life cycle thinking represent a broad toolbox of approaches. As you've seen, there's lots of different points at which we can intervene with these kinds of approaches and lots of different levels within the business at which we can bring this uh, these kinds of approaches to bear. So when we're talking about LCA, we're not talking about turning the handle and doing a life cycle assessment and coming up with a report and a goal and scope and these kinds of things. There's lots of different ways in which we can utilize the toolbox that that represents at various different uh, touch points within our business decision making processes. And we can leverage these in, like I've said, in multiple different areas. So this is product design and innovation, business strategy assessment, consumer communication, corporate reporting. It runs the whole gamut, really underpinning uh, what we're doing in the sustainability area. 
the key thing is to use the right tool at the right time. Uh, we'll be limited by the amount of information we have, the amount of data that we have, uh, and we'll need to make sure that we're using the right tool to, to leverage what we have available to us uh, to our absolute uh, maximum impact. Uh, and finally, we can really use the new science that uh, we're developing to advance the field of LCA, making it better for, for decision making everywhere and also unlocking those new decision making paradigms. We can can go beyond what we can make decisions on the basis of today uh, by really pushing forward the life cycle assessment science. And that's it. I must have been speaking very quickly, running slightly ahead of time, so apologies for, for that, Juma. Uh, but uh, just to flag here, again, we are expanding the team uh, and we're looking for, for more talented and uh, in interested people to come and to come and join us. Uh, so if you're looking for a new challenge, there's another QR code there for you to scan uh, for our lifecycle assessment practitioner. Uh, we're also looking for sustainability scientists, so uh, feel free to, to check out um, to LinkedIn, check out the uh, recruitment website to, to look for those opportunities. And yeah, plenty of time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, James. That is really fascinating, very insightful. Um, so yeah, the floor is open, virtual floor is open for questions. You can unmute yourself and uh, ask James questions. We can perhaps also access chat, but I'm not very good at accessing <laughs> chat while I'm talking. <laughs> if uh, Angie and Luis could uh, help me out with uh, if there is any question on the chat room. Uh, that would be great. Hi, um, Hi. I'm Louise. I, I just have a question. Do you have any specific examples of products or product lines or packaging or packaging lines where having done an LCA, you, you've, the decision makers have said, right, we're, we're not using that kind of packaging or that kind of ink anymore, or we can sell it, but not where they don't have that, the, the, not in countries without the proper waste processing system to back up that, that thing? It's uh, it's difficult to comment on specific examples, as you can imagine, for reasons of commercial confidentiality. Uh, but <laughs> as long as you can trust me, I can say that there are situations where uh, where the work that we've done has has really made a big difference in the way that uh, the decisions have been made. Um, the best ones I can point to are the ones that we've uh, we made publicly facing claims about. So things around um, concentration and compaction for. Uh, for laundry products, things around um, increasing the proportion of non-dairy proteins in ice cream. Uh, those kinds of areas can really be helped supported by uh, by the information that we've provided. And do you follow up afterwards? So if, because you see as a consumer, what I see is things like ring pulls going from plastic to say cardboard. And I, I can see things changing all around me, but um, I, you never really get to hear whether the follow up was, yes, that was a really good idea or that wasn't a good idea or that worked in this way. But um, do you communicate to the public on that level? Uh, I can't speak too much to communicate to the public, but I can but the the way that we work with with the business it's as a as a partnership um and so those those follow ups are definitely are certainly done um it's not the great thing about being embedded within the business as opposed to operating outside as a more consultative um consultancy style approach is that you really do you're there all the way up to product launch and then you're there past product launch and you can assess what's happened you can bring that in to to the next iteration of of innovation or the next innovation of portfolio analysis um and so, yeah. um so I guess you see other competitors look at what you've done and then copy it, thinking that was a good idea. I'm glad they did it. <laughs> so I'm just going to jump in. All right, thank you. I'll leave up this to other people. Thank you. I I was going to say it's it's Angie here. I had a I had a quick question. Um, basically, it was well, it wasn't. It was quite a long one. It was Ednet does stuff with wastewater treatment, so we do microbial systems in wastewater treatment systems, and we we often don't know the fate or the impact of of many of these sorts of things in the environment. Um, and you mentioned that part of the LCA when you originally spoke about it was about disposal of of the, uh, but I didn't see anything uh, you kind of you, you did it quite quickly but I didn't see anything at the product design phase and and bearing in mind that we have sort of significant knowledge gaps in the fate of many of these things in in on the environment in wastewater treatment I was just wondering how you can or or whether you 
actually quantify or measure and, and therefore you're able to improve on, on that aspect of a product's life cycle. You know, that just that sort of flushing down the the system. Sure. So there's there's two main areas when it comes to to the downstream part uh, that are really important for Unilever. The first, uh, which falls more under my remit, is the the greenhouse gas impact associated with the degradation of fossil based chemicals. Because uh, obviously, when you're taking fossil carbon out of the ground, putting it into some kind of uh, surfactant, uh, for example, sending that down into wastewater treatment, that's going to lead to to fossil uh, CO2 potentially being released to the environment. So we can, from a life cycle perspective, we can work on on those parts and try and uh, understand the potential pros and cons of switching away from fossil-based feedstocks to bio-based feedstocks for that particular downstream impact. The other part is more the safety side, uh, and that's dealt with um, through uh, through the safety guys in our team who conduct environmental risk assessments of the various uh, ingredients that we use. Um, so we've got a big ecotox team. We've got a big biodegradability team as well, uh, who are understanding the biodegradability profiles of the various ingredients that we use uh, under various circumstances and under very under different um, fate scenarios. So whether it's going to wastewater treatment, whether it's going into fresh water, understanding how our ingredients biodegrade, what their degradation products are, uh, and through that understanding. Um, how yeah how persistent they are in the environment what the potential for any environmental toxicity is but we tend to do that at a much more targeted um ingredient and receptor level if these kinds of things aren't usually dealt with particularly well by life cycle assessment because it has to have that sort of more high level uh, approach to it um and so we do we do use things like use talks to get a high level understanding but it's far more useful from a product innovation perspective to do that far more detailed environmental risk assessment study uh, when it comes to our ingredients going into wastewater treatment Brilliant. thank you and we've had another question here if Juma wants a hand um saying as there are multiple methodologies to account for biogenic carbon in the overall gwp impact um this is from Ar Eric Ting um, was wondering, was interested to know how Unilever does. Is it counted as a negative emission? Is it, and is it later emitted depending upon end of life scenario? So this is the biogenic carbon in the overall GWP impact. Absolutely. So there's a lot of discussion around biogenic carbon when it comes to life cycle assessment. And this tends to be it tends to, to balance out as kind of a moot point. Uh, the issue that we we face is that when we're looking at it at the life cycle in silos, so looking at it from cradle to gate, there are potential uh, greenhouse gas benefits associated with biogenic carbon, where you're taking carbon from the atmosphere, putting it into into a product. When that product then gets uh, to end of life, uh, as you mentioned in your question, uh, that carbon is going back into the atmosphere. And so whether or not we we take as a negative and then treat it as a positive or whether we treat it as zero and zero the net effect uh, across the life cycle uh, balances each other out the only deviation from this is where you have particularly long-lasting products uh, but being a fast-moving consumer goods company that isn't necessarily something that Unilever has to uh, has to contend with that's more of an issue for the construction sector for things like furniture for buildings all those kinds of things um, so we we follow uh, generally speaking, uh, the rules advocated for by PEF, which is the product environmental footprint uh, method, which is that we will not account for temporary sequestration of carbon into products unless there's demonstrable evidence that that sequestration is going to last for more than 100 years, uh, which, as I mentioned, for fast moving consumer goods uh, isn't an issue we often have to contend with. Um, so biogenic carbon is very important when it comes to reducing our overall greenhouse gas impact for that exact reason that we're borrowing the carbon from the atmosphere and just replenishing atmospheric stocks of carbon dioxide, as opposed to taking carbon that's been safely stored under the ground, not bothering anybody for a long, very, very long time. Taking that and putting that into the atmosphere is something that we definitely want to avoid. Um, so when it comes to accounting, there are methods that are out there that are different, but from a whole life cycle perspective, uh, the big picture is that um, it's all about understanding how the carbon is cycling through the system. And we take account of that uh, in what we believe is uh, a robust and uh, sensible manner. Juma, I don't see any more questions here. I have one more if you're OK for time. Oh, something else has just come up. Uh, Oh, yep, a couple more. Yong Chang has said for the eco table of the projects, is LCA from cradle, cradle to gate or is it 
to grave disposal to the environment? So generally speaking, for eco-labels, it's important to take account of the full life cycle. And so it will be a cradle to grave assessment. There may be deviations in individual schemes, for example, around consumer use and sort of indirect uh, emissions. Uh, but for the for the schemes that we're working with, we're looking at a, at a cradle to, to grave basis, so including that disposal element. Okay, and uh, we have another question from Godfrey who says, which software would you recommend for doing LCA? I know there's quite a few out there. Some of them are quite <laughs> expensive as well. Yes, there are a few. And uh, to be honest, we use we use a lot of them uh, for various different reasons. Uh, so we use uh, Gabby. Uh, we also use SEMA Pro. Uh, and a few people in the team also use one called Brightway, uh, which is a sort of more it's it's a, a python based version of lifecycle assessment software you can use to ask more interesting questions uh, that you can't necessarily do as rapidly and those are the two pieces of software but of the commercially available softwares out there gabby and sema pro are the ones that that we use okay um i i had just one more question on um re regenerative agriculture and other agro ecological approaches do you um you know bearing in mind that we could go from quite a, a large spectrum on the on the production side in terms of um, you know greenhouse gas emissions is is that taken into account are you able to get to that kind of nuance uh so yeah regenerative agriculture is a is a major part of our strategy going forward particularly in our in our foods and uh, nutrition businesses um where agriculture as you can imagine uh, plays a, a major part in our impact and so yes we are uh we can use life cycle assessment and life cycle approaches to get a, a better understanding of the impact of regenerative approaches. We can also use them uh, to then play that forward from field to ingredient and from ingredient to product to understand at a product and a portfolio level uh, what the potential impact of regenerative processes are. So very powerful tool life cycle assessment for doing those kinds of things for making those links all the way from the from the cradle end of the life cycle through to the uh, to the to the business. That's amazing. We had a, just a quick um, I, interrupt me, um, Juma, if if I'm going over the you know because I'll just go through the questions. Uh, Yong Chang just came up with an ancillary saying, do you include toxicity categories as well um, for the whole LCA from cradle to grave? So we'll we'll take them into account. Uh, the toxicity categories are are less mature uh, and are less. Um, What's the word? There's a lot more variability and uncertainty associated with toxicity categories as a result of their mode of action. So the the cause effect chain for something like climate change, where you emit a greenhouse gas, it has a radiative forcing effect in the atmosphere, and that causes uh, more energy to be trapped. Those kinds of things we can quantify quite well from a life cycle impact assessment perspective because of that very short, well-defined cause effect chain. When it comes to toxicity, uh, you're emitting uh you well you're characterizing emissions flows from one compartment to another so from the technosphere from the product system out to a particular portion of the environment be it air fresh water soil you then have to account for the fate of that material which is a stochastic process uh which adds more uncertainty then you have to account for the exposure which is another stochastic process then you have to account for the effect and so by the time you've gone through those various layers of different uh the different models, the uncertainty around those categories has started to, to get pretty large. So we do take into account, but as I mentioned before, the toxicity and the safety side, we tend to deal with far more uh, in a more targeted approach using environmental risk assessment. So uh, I suppose on an ancillary to that, we've got a question here that says, um, because Unilever does deal with thousands of products and worldwide, where of course the treatment systems do vary, as Louise mentioned, have, have you preferred a, um, an LCC of all these products? If yes, is the data accessible to public for general research? Uh, so we, as part of our annual footprinting process, as I mentioned, we we sample around about three to four thousand of our products to put through that uh, that system, uh, that calculation system to figure out the the impact, and that's for the for the carbon footprint as well as a couple of other metrics that we can use internally. 
as you can imagine, it's highly confidential information. It uses highly confidential formulations for, for all of our products. Uh, and so unfortunately, it's not accessible to the public uh, for, for general research. Uh, but that's not to say that through partnerships that we have um, through our academic research, we can't leverage that information, uh, but under a confidentiality and non-disclosure style agreement. Would you say there's research gaps in that sort of, in in that sort of, um, you know, from household to, to back to treatment side of it? You know, it, it, from your point of view, you think, well, actually, if I had to, in that whole life cycle where the where the sort of the uncertainties are, would you say that that is an an element of uncertainty because of the different wastewater treatments, because of the different fates of things? There is, I mean, from a from a life cycle science perspective, there's certainly uh, a gap there. It's quite a hard gap to fill. I know there's a lot of uh, work going on in that area. Another thing that we do is we support the um, the UNEP CTAC life cycle. Uh, I forget the, the exact word for it, but the life cycle program run by UNEP. And I know that they're supporting Ustox in in developing uh, the model there to to account for that that gap within. Life cycle assessment. It's a it's a commonly acknowledged and uh, and well researched area. Uh, understanding that that fate part of um, of the the stuff that goes down the drain. Like I say, it's it's something that we can mitigate by having the the very robust ecotoxicity and uh, environmental risk assessment that we do on our particular products. But from life cycle assessment as a field, it's certainly an interesting area where there is. Uh, yet we, we're yet to achieve consensus and therefore there's potential gap in the research then. Okay, Juma, I don't see any more questions here. Do you okay, have thanks. any further thoughts? I have, uh, I have a few questions. I see Hansen again uh, is posing some questions. Uh, so I could, I could ask some questions. Uh, so you mentioned about uh, Lucy LCA software. Is that an in-house software or is it kind of publicly available and we can use? It's something we developed uh, in, in partnership with the Natural Capital Project <coughs> and with the University of Minnesota. So it's uh, the 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 paper is out there and um, I believe the software is out there as well through through Natural Capital Project. So yeah, if you if you Google it or find it on Google Scholar, you'll find the the publication from 2017. It's Chaplin Kramer et al. as the as the lead author, and then the details of the of the Lucy program and the Lucy software is there. Okay, um, at present, um, I mean, you you yeah, you have like three thousand, three to five thousand products uh, that that are on shelves today. But is there a um, would you name a few of them for which we can see, you know, carbon footprint level on them? And and from this presentation, we can probably take on some points to interpret those numbers, to basically visualize, okay, these are the activities that were included, and this is the number that reflects that. So we, we, we don't yet put carbon footprints on our on our products per se. We have an ambition to communicate around our carbon footprint uh, and we're putting in place the systems to facilitate that. But as you can imagine with the portfolio as 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 large and as broad as Unilever's, it's uh, it's quite a job. The mm -hmm. the issue, the main issue with with carbon footprint numbers and communicating that to consumers is that in the absence of any context they are almost completely meaningless. That's uh, right. Yeah. I, I have a, a pack of corn scotch eggs in my uh, in my fridge that have a carbon footprint number on and even with all my experience in life cycle assessment and carbon footprinting over these years it still means nothing to me the fact that there's 200 grams or 20 grams or whatever it is of carbon dioxide emitted as a result of each of those corn scotch eggs so uh, not to say that corn aren't doing a great job by putting out uh, the information and, and putting it out there to, to build carbon literacy and consumers it's a it's a noble goal but the the key thing for us is making sure that it all makes sense and can drive the correct decision making um so that's part of what we're we're looking at as the eco labeling program uh, to make sure that we can give that context and drive those those proper decision making uh in the context of uh the disclosure of the environmental impacts of our products 
it's not that we've got anything to hide. It's just uh, making sure the science is there to help consumers use it for robust decision making, as opposed to just being uh, taking up space on the back. There are a couple of questions, I think, on the chat. Um, yeah, the, for the latest question, I think um, one of the questions you asked, Juma, was mirrored one of the ones on the chat, but Yong Chang was also wondering if you could um, briefly explain how the environmental risk assessments for your products is done. Is it quantitative or qualitative or, or, or what kind of metrics are used? Uh, I personally am not fully acquainted with how they do it. I know that it is a qualitative risk assessment that they carry out, uh, but I don't know the specifics of the, the methodology. I could recommend uh, looking at the, uh, the the website that was in the presentation uh, around the science that we do. That may point you in, in some useful directions around the, the risk environmental risk assessment side. Um, but like I say, we're a, we're a team of 100 within SIAC and it's other people within that team that, that deal with that area. OK, that's all I've got for the moment. Um, James, I have a question on the on the um, net zero emission of uh, Unilever by 2039. So yeah, which, which is great, uh, which is ambitious as well. And that's how it should be. Um, so if you have to like pick up, say, you know, a big elephant in the room for a uh, few representative products, maybe one food product. Food product is probably understandable that moving away from animal to plant-based makes more sense. Uh, but um, like, you know, uh, maybe washing liquid, maybe shampoo or something. Some few, uh, if, if you could bring up some example uh, products for which you think, okay, if, if we cut down emissions in, in those areas, there we can hit that um, goal. We can hit that target um, quite quickly. Absolutely. Well, as you mentioned, net zero is a very ambitious target, and the the nature of our portfolio is that unfortunately there is not one big lever that we can pull, not one silver bullet that will uh, will fix all of our problems, as you can as you can imagine. Um, but there are active areas that we're that we're focusing on very strongly in order to, to help achieve those targets. So for example, in our home care business, we have what we call our clean future strategy. Uh, and that is around making sure that in addition to, to product superiority, we're taking into account the environmental impacts uh, associated with the, the the home care products that we're putting out there. And a key tenet of that is around um, carbon cycling, carbon provenance and, uh, and feedstock switching. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, carbon in the ground is fine, carbon in the atmosphere not so good. So if we can move to systems where we're cycling that carbon from the atmosphere back to the atmosphere, uh, that's going to make uh, some some big steps towards achieving uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions for products which have historically been been based on that more um, more linear system of, of, of carbon cycling. Uh, great, thank you very much. I believe there is no other question in the chat room. Uh, what's the? No, I don't see anything else. Juma, there is something about what is the process to apply for this research, but I'm assuming. Uh, I I don't know if Ali can can elaborate on that because I, I, I think you gave QR codes for certainly some of the practitioners you were looking for, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, so there's a QR code on one of the slides for um, for the PhD uh, that we that we have with Radbao. So that's looking at uh, using computational techniques to to fill data gaps within lifecycle inventory data. Um, and so that's a, a four year LCA program, uh, PhD program, sorry, uh, working between between us here in the UK and, and out in the Netherlands. Uh, and then there's the, the one on screen there, which is um, for a, a life cycle assessment uh, analyst on practitioner role, which is based at our, our Colworth site, uh, which is in the beautiful Bedfordshire countryside, that's where I'm based, um, uh, to, to, to join our, our expanding team of, of sustainability scientists. So the PhD, you'll find, uh, if you, 
yeah, if you'll find it. It's on it's on LinkedIn. If you search for Radboud uh, or Unilever, you should be able to find it on in the job listings there. But if you can uh, flip back a couple of slides, uh, tell you what, I'll flip back a couple of slides now to give you the opportunity just to quickly scan that QR code. Uh, so you've got the link to the PhD. One of the questions we always get in the anaerobic digestion world is, um, there, you know, is there enough bio to produce energy? And of course, we always have indirect land use issues and that sort of stuff. But, you know, is that what is that sort of that really large picture, bearing in mind that we are going to be increasingly asking our land to do much more to make more products um, and those sorts of things. So there's always that meshing with farmers who themselves are running businesses. Is that is that something you've looked at in this in this whole thing as well? Is there going to be enough or are we going to have to look at different trajectories? So that's part of the question that underpins that Lucy LCA uh, that I mentioned. It's understanding what are the broader system effects and the scaling effects when you're talking about these, these massive wholesale shifts and we can use uh, those there's more advanced LCA tools, applying those sort of spatial techniques, understanding what happens when you expand the demand for certain feedstocks in certain areas to, to help inform those decisions. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely something that we consider and it's something that, as I mentioned, we've, we've worked with external uh, academic partners to develop new methods and new techniques to really embed into the decision-making in those areas. Okay, and I don't see any more questions, so. Over to you, Gemma. OK, thank you very much, uh, James, for uh, for a fascinating talk. Very, very useful, very helpful, very insightful. So yeah. hopefully we can oh, okay. we can we have persuaded the uh, the audience oh, well, to use that. <laughs> Okay, so we move on to the uh, next speaker. Our next speaker is um, Dr. Adrian Hickson, is uh, from NNFCC. He's managing director of NNFCC. He's also NNFCC's lead consultant for bio-based products. He is a chartered chemist with over 20 years research and consulting experience within the chemical and uh, bio-based products industry. He maintains a wide client base, providing consulting and facilitating services for both the public and private sector. Private sector clients include SME technology developers, multinational FMCG companies, and business investors. Adrian has taken an active role in the development of the bioeconomy and bio-based products. He has been a member of the UK Bioeconomy Business Environment Working Group, the European Commission Expert Group for Bio-based Products and Scottish Bioeconomy Council. Adrian is a goal-focused APM qualified project manager with experience of coordinating large multi-site and multi-stakeholder projects. He has an excellent track record of delivering complex projects to high quality on budget and within deadlines, whether a market analysis, sustainability appraisal, or a business option study. Adrian takes a solution-based approach to each study, working with the client to ensure the right questions are asked, ensuring project outputs are aligned with client's expectations and desired outcomes. Adrian holds a PhD from the University of Liverpool and has held research positions at the University of Colorado, USA, the University of Dundee, UK. Prior to joining NNFCC, he was a project manager at SAFC Pharma Sigma Altridge. Let's learn about biorefinery status and developments from Adrian. Thank you, Juma, uh, for that. Um... A long, long biog. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, yes, as um, Juma said, I'd like to. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to take you through um, what's happening in the uh, biorefinery um, sector. So, can you see my my slides, Juma? Yes, we can. Yeah, great. Um, 
and just talk you through the activities, what's changing, what's um, what, what's actually happening in that in that sector. So for those of you that don't um, know uh, NSCC, as Juma um, indicated, we're a consultancy uh, based, based in York and we work across the bioeconomy sector and we've been doing that for nearly uh, 20 years. Um, we work right across that sector, so that's from large heat and power um, supply through liquid fuels, um, gaseous uh, fuels into bio-based products, be that materials or be that chemicals. Uh, and we work with a broad range of organisations, um, large multinational corporates like Unilever, who we've worked with um, um, several times in the past, through to startups and university spin-outs, government departments and um, universities. So we have a broad, a broad client base, um, but the questions tend to be the same uh, that clients put to us in, in those spaces. It's around understanding um, market, understanding market development, what the regulations and the technologies are that underpins those evolving um, markets. Um, and what are the sustainability impacts um, on those different product bases of different supply chains. Um, and they come down to um, three overlapping areas, I, I would say, uh, really. There's what we actually um, do. That's where obviously the bar refineries come into play at the start uh, of any product uh, manufacture. But how do we um, stimulate that market development in terms of proving what we're doing is sustainable or correct um, and improving that how do we actually measure that so what i try to point out quite often is there's probably more um voluntary regulation around by refining and bio-based products than people uh, possibly uh, recognize so we have organizations like the round table for S sustainable biomaterials uh, and the iscc working with uh, stakeholder groups working with individual companies to develop projects that not only certify uh, manufacturing but work to develop the right concepts around manufacturing and the RSB particularly do a lot of work in this space to bring stakeholders together in this bio-based space it's often different industry sectors that maybe haven't worked um, together uh, before or maybe haven't worked as closely as they need to. So land-based industries working with aviation or working with chemical uh, manufacturers. And often people don't appreciate the number of standards that we have that underpin that work. So the, RS, uh, the uh, BSI, for example, and SEN at the European level have a range of standards that cover how to measure um, um, the sustainability products and how to communicate um, that correctly, whether it be business to business or business to consumer. And as James pointed out, it is um, you have to be careful what you can say on a product pack to make sure it is um, correct and also understandable. As, as James also said, there is a difficulty around what is the context um, for those sustainability numbers, whether it be carbon footprint or something else that goes on a pack and also making sure that we don't end up with this carbon tunnel vision. Um, there is a strong emphasis on net zero and carbon emissions, but there's much more to the sustainability of biorefining. Um, and we need to make sure we also look at not over environmental impacts, but also social um, impacts as well. So the question becomes then, if we're going to talk about biorefineries, then what do we really mean? What What is um, a biorefinery? I'm often posed with questions or rather statements um, focused around we really need to develop biorefineries or to become more sustainable in bio-based chemical manufacturer, uh, manufacturer we need to um, deploy biorefineries um, as if 
it's a first of a kind um, idea as if it's a concept that we need to um, target, which isn't uh, really the case. And I'll, I'll come on to, to talk a little bit about that. There's a couple of definitions um, here. So most of the definitions that are around that talk about producing multiple uh, products from a biorefinery. Um, it's certainly true if the, if the goal or aim of a biorefinery um, is resource efficiency um, and resource efficiency often um, aligns with economic um, efficiency as well, um, then we need to be using all parts of the biomass that enters uh, that refinery, which generally means making multiple product. But again, this idea of that's an aspiration. Uh, it may be in certain um, areas, certain types of biorefineries, but I don't know of a biorefinery that produces just one product. All the biorefineries that I know of produce, um, I would say, probably three products, certainly two, but often three or, or more or more products. What is important about the idea of biorefineries, the scale uh, that it operates at, it certainly has to be of a, of a scale that makes the integration of um, process units and the potential to produce multiple products at a sellable market, the relevant scale is certainly important. So if we're thinking about refineries, by refineries, and as often as the um, Renewable Energy Laboratory definition said, they're akin to a, an oil refinery. Well, yes, I would say to, to a point, um, that's, that's correct. Uh, but there is some fundamental differences that, that people really should, should be aware of. Um, oil refineries, um, they're large. They're extremely large. Millions of tonnes per year of product flows through an oil refinery. Um, it's a scale that will you know, never be applicable to biorefineries. The nature of the feedstock, the location of feedstocks is just fundamentally different. So there is um, a scale difference as, as um, implications. Uh, I think there's also another important difference and yes, Oil refineries are chemically complex. The chemical engineering um, is complex, uh, but in some ways they're actually really rather simple. I mean, they, they all process oil. Um, and yes, oil varies uh, around the world. It's not the same in the US as it would be um, in the Middle East, but it's not that different. And at the heart, um, it's a mixture of uh, liquids that can be dist distilled, uh, fractionated by one process technology, which is then the resulting outputs are processed differently within the refinery. Biomass isn't um, isn't quite as simple as that. Um, so when we start talking about biorefineries, we're dealing with a much more complicated landscape. So the potential inputs. Um, really differ quite significantly if we think about oil based, um, so vegetable oil based uh, refineries and compare the difference between a vegetable oil and starch, for example, another common input to uh, refineries, just fundamentally different um, chemical entities um, and compare that again to lignocellulosic crops, again, fundamentally different uh, physical and chemical materials. And of course, having different chemical um, and material inputs means different process units um, and different process units on different uh, refineries and different inputs, different processes leading to a much wider product range than what you would get from an oil refinery. So biorefineries are much more complicated in their concept and much more difficult to communicate, which is why often the definitions uh, are quite loose um, and that does cause interesting discussions around policy development particularly. So just to pick out a few a few examples, just to home in on this, you know, idea of current 
uh, bio refineries make one product or current bio refineries are small, a small scale. So certainly the bio refineries that we have around the world um, process material on the hundreds of thousands of tons scale. So that's the comparison to oil refineries, millions of tons as opposed to hundreds of thousands uh, of tons. They are often integrated facilities. So maybe rather than comparing a biorefinery to an oil refinery, we should be comparing it to a petrochemical complex where multiple uh, companies are based on one, one site and share um, feedstocks. Pro, one company processing um, the, the product of a primary process, for example. So if we look at the Cargill uh, by refinery in Nebraska um, at Blair, um, that refinery produces sugar, corn, corn oil, okay, established um, products, but also has an ethanol output, has a lactic acid output. That lactic acid is converted on site to polylactic acid, um, a bio-based um, plastic. It produces food grade lactic acid and, and a refatol sugar derivative as well. So there's multiple outputs from that refinery. Uh, the same would go for uh, Cargill's plant in Iowa, which also produces, well, Ajinomoto use the, the sugar processed at that plant and to make um, amino acids. And the DuPont, or what was the DuPont Tate and Lyle refinery also in the US, that not only makes sugar derivatives, but makes 1,3-propane um, diol, which is used to make, um, well, an ingredient in cosmetic products, but also makes um, polymers and, and fibres. And in Europe as well, um, there's probably a larger number of um, biorefineries than people uh, appreciate. So studies have identified over 400 uh, biorefineries across Europe, whether in demonstration or in commercial activities. Um, we can see by looking at those um, refineries that are operating, um, they are um, what would be called first generation crop based refineries, so processing sugar, starch, uh, oil, for example. But we also have a large number of um, paper, uh, would have been paper mills or forest uh, biorefineries uh, producing multiple outputs. And then some others that are focused around um, fiber processing and some lignocellulosic um, processing plants. And again, they can be multiple sites so the example of the bar refinery in france has a sugar um refinery and a, uh, a wheat based refinery on the same site and they share utilities um and they share a railhead as well because transport um, is another important aspect of large-scale manufacturing both to receive uh feedstocks but also to move products out of refinery sites so they share um, a rail infrastructure as well. So wood re refining, I think it's an important starting point for thinking about uh, biorefineries. Um, a lot of the technology uh, thinking that we have for lignocellulosic biorefineries really originate from uh, the wood pulping industry. Um, and it's always had multiple outputs. Um, I've picked an example here, Borregard, Norwegian um, company. Uh, they primary are, are a cellulosic um, producer, speciality cell cellulose. And that speciality cellulose of different types serves multiple markets from cosmetics to food, um, excipient for pharmaceutical production using construction uh, material. Um, there's a, an adage in the the paper industry around uh, lignin, of course you are essentially if you're a paper producer you're um, processing lignocellulose a combination of cellulose lignin and hemi hemicellulose um, and there's always been an adage that you can do anything with lignin but make money um, yes that has been true to a degree but Borregard have always had a long history of making money out of lignin across a range of markets from concrete additives, um, animal feed, 
used in batteries. Uh, it's used for making um, dye uh, materials. They've also produced uh, vanillin, uh, a substitute for natural vanilla um, for, a, for a long time, and they have an ethanol output. So a simple, relatively old uh, biorefinery there, pro um, processing uh, wood um, with outputs, um, three, four, five, six, seven different outputs coming from that uh, refinery. And certainly in a European um, context, a lot of the evolution, a lot of development um, of biorefineries in Europe is coming out of that forest forest industry. So I've picked a couple of examples uh, there. So uh, Stora, Stora Enzo, um, a, pulp, a pulp company, uh, forward thinking, um, certainly um, a leader in new product uh, development. So they're taking their lignin uh, material and they produce um, around 50,000 tonnes of lignin a year. You know, a lot of material to uh, to work with, but they're developing anodes uh, for lithium batteries where the lignin is processed to produce uh, material suitable as, a, uh, as an anode. They're exploring um, converting their chemical, uh, their sugar uh, side streams to um, novel chemicals or so novel furan uh, chemicals that can be used to make uh, new polymers. And they've got a range of novel uh, fibrillated or nanocellulose that they're using um, in packaging materials as coatings, as barriers. So there's a lot of innovation around those um, companies that have the feedstocks to hand um, and are always looking um, for best value uh, conversions of those uh, primary streams and byproduct uh, streams. Another example is um, UPM. So one product of, of wood refining is, is tal oil. Um, they've now taken that, that tal oil and through a, a combination of pretreatment cleanups and then hydro treating, uh, are converting that tal oil to renewable um, diesel, which is a, a fungible fuel that can be blended on any in any volume into into diesels. Um, alongside that diesel output is also a, a naphtha cut. So naphtha is the relatively short chain uh, carbon oligomers that you get from typically oil um, refining and, uh, and cracking. Um, but they're producing a renewable version which then gets sold onto chemical producers and we'll come back to that a little a little later on. So certainly in thinking about how biorefineries are development, um, there's a lot of activity around sustainable aviation fuel, so SAF uh, production. So what would have um, been um, a feedstock for uh, diesel production, so fatty acid uh, methyl esters, uh, fame diesel, those used cooking oils, um, used uh, vegetable oils, are tending to be directed towards um, sustainable aviation fuel um, and like in the example hydro treating of those materials. Um, I think there's a recognition certainly um, in the market that aviation is going to be very hard um, to decarbonize in the, in the short to medium uh, term, certainly until hydrogen planes are more, are more developed. Um, so it's quite um, a strong pull from that industry for novel feedstocks. Um, and the interesting aspect about processing of vegetable oils, whether they be virgin or used vegetable oils, is its mix um, and ability to be processed within existing oil refinery infrastructure. Um, so you're seeing some oil refineries taking portions of uh, vegetable oils and processing those. Maybe more interesting is this example of Grand Prix. Um, it's outside Paris, um, one of Total's refineries. For various uh, reason, they decided to shut down uh, that refinery as an oil um, producing or oil processing refinery, uh, and they're caught in, uh, converting that to a zero um, crude refinery. And we're on that complex, they'll have a mixture 
of diesel and aviation fuel uh, manufacturer uh, alongside a bio-based plastics polymerization plant, some chemical uh, recycling uh, process units uh, and two photovoltaic solar um, power plants. So using the infrastructure of the oil or refinery with its utilities uh, base, but no longer processing um, oil and becoming a, a biorefinery. Um, so moving on from those forest um, outputs, this is probably what's talked most and what most people see as biorefineries, um, a refinery that has the ability to process uh, lignocellulose. Um, I think the difference from from the the pulpit there's two there's two differences to um, to consider. So we have um, a broader feedstock potential. So whereas pulping generally has a focus on the cellulose fiber, and that fiber needs to be of a certain type, a length, a strength, um, for example. Um, here we're focusing on the production of of sugar um, that can be used in downstream processes in in the main. So there's more feedstocks that can be used. So residues, corn stover, uh, wheat straw, the gas, for example. Um, and in general, we are looking for that sugar. So there's an economic question there. So if we look at fractionation uh, technologies, which are designed to separate the cellulose from the hemicellulose uh, and the lignin, uh, they tend to be reasonably expensive um, technology of processes which need um, the economic payback of a polymer. Um, typically a, a cellulose polymer, it could possibly be a lignin polymer with high, uh, high value uh, markets, whereas uh, the pretreatment process, it's all about reducing cost, um, the cost of cellulose, it's sugar. Um, it's that, that's the end game um, in town there. So when it comes to that reducing um, cost, it's reducing cost, but not at the expense of the ability to process that sugar stream, either chemically or via biotechnology processes further down. But it's all around the pretreatment, um, those pretreatment costs, performance, performance and cost. And there's a range of approaches that are out there. Um, it's hard to pin out uh, which one is probably going to win in terms of economics and it probably depends on the downstream uh, processing um, but certainly I would say steam explosion and dilute acid are the ones that are used um, predominantly but there are more, maybe arguably more interesting technologies being developed so I've picked out Lixia here which is a spin out of um, Imperial College now based in, in Sweden with a demonstration plant who are using ionic liquids uh, to fractionate their lignin cellulose so that's where uh, the activity needs to lie and where there's still scope for process and engineering optimization. Um, those of you that have wa watched this space for a while um, will know that we had um, a raft of technology development, um, uh, developments going back seven, eight, nine, nine years with lignocellulosic um, ethanol refineries, um, that were really pulled along through fuel, liquid fuel regulations being, being built. Um, and then a lot of them closed down when the oil price um, went down. And there's still debates whether or not it's a fundamental technology issue or whether it's an economics um, issue. I think largely it is economics um, driven and the policy um, incentives just weren't significant enough to keep those plants operating when oil price crash, but as you would expect, oil prices have been high recently and, and some of those plants have come back on stream and are now uh, producing like the Crescentino plant uh, in Italy. It's also slightly different now. The learnings from those original plant builds like Project Liberty, the Poet DSM um, collaboration, that technology was developed implemented at scale and now that technology is available for license so it's much easier for project developers to come into this space and, and use off-the-shelf um, technology. 
Um, I've also picked out Raisin here, a, a Brazilian um, fuel company, and they've got quite ambitious uh, plans. Uh, they've got plants operating, plant in build, and um, a lot of ambition to really scale out and start producing um, ethanol plants based on their um, lignocellulosic technology, which is the gas uh, based. Um, and those lignocellulosic plants, those first ones were ethanol based, driven by fuels policies. But I just wanted to point out that ethanol is not just about fuel. Ethanol here has, still has massive potential as a platform chemical for the, the chemicals industry because of its easy transformation into ethylene, which isn't new technology. Um, even back in the 60s and 70s in Brazil, ethanol was converted to, to ethylene. Um, and that process is run by a company called Braschem for polyethylene uh, production at 200,000 tonnes uh, per year today. And there's a wide range of molecules you can see there, all the way down from polyethylenes to monoethylene glycol, which goes into um, polyesters, but also for the surfactants production as well. It's not all about um, fuel uh, production. Um, we're now seeing biorefineries being developed um, using lignocellulosic materials for chemical production. So this is UPM again, um, the same company that was processing tal oil from their pulping operations. And this is a biorefinery that's currently being, being built in, in Germany. Um, again, scale hundreds of thousands of tons for a chemical biorefinery that is a large volume but compared to a petrochemical complex it's relatively um, small um, you'll note the investment it's probably worthwhile um, thinking about what we're really talking about in terms of capital and cost for biorefinery build it's not cheap we're talking hundreds of millions of pounds to build a biorefinery um, and all of the considerations when you're investing that amount of money is the same as an oil uh, refinery, understanding feedstock supply, understanding how complicated you want to make that um, refinery, where it's going to be located near to feedstock, near to markets um, and risk. The more unit operations you have on a bar refinery, the more risk there is there, the more products you make, the more risk there is with business uh, development. So there's a large element of risk um, there. So this UPM refinery is focused on uh, uh, MEG, uh, monoethylene glycol uh, for BET, uh, for PET production, but it's also making um, functional fillers out of the lignin and components. So that will use both sugars um, and the lignin fraction of that lignin cellulose, which is what's um, required. It's not a biotechnology based, uh, process, which is often another misconception when processing lignocellulose to produce sugars, that therefore downstream fermentation, not always. There's chemical processes out there that's converting cellulose its sugars um, to products. Um, so often the other consideration around um, biorefinery development, obviously you're processing a feedstock um, to an end product, but you need an energy base, you need utilities to heat and power uh, that refinery. Uh, certainly anaerobic digestion in terms of fermentation facilities has always been part of a refinery uh, build. I think what's changing uh, now is the further integration of the refinery with anaerobic digestion and the wider agricultural uh, systems. So typically the anaerobic digestion has been used for waste water treatment prior to discharge. Um, so treating that aqueous fraction that comes from fermentation processes. Um, now these the new um, AD facilities that we're seeing on, on refineries are taking in their own feedstocks and not only processing the, the byproducts of the primary biorefining process, but taking in additional 
uh, materials like manures and slurries to co-process with refinery products and then supply the energy where it be back to the grid in electricity um, or heat and power for the actual refinery operation. We're also seeing more wind power. Um, as wind power decreases, it becomes more attractive to build wind power into biorefinery um, thinking. Fuels policy is increasingly driving greenhouse gas uh, reductions. The targets every year become tighter. It becomes more difficult for biofuel producers to hit those greenhouse gas reduction targets, which is leading them to think about the incorporation of renewable energy. Um, and we, and we see more build out of, uh, of wind power. And of course, as you build more renewables onto a biorefinery site, it gives you more biofeedstock to make uh, bio-based products. So keeping the carbon for products and using other forms uh, of energy for electricity um, and, and also heat in certain respects. And I think this all really plays out. This is GIVO's plans for net zero um, refineries. Uh, and you can see in this how they're trying to integrate uh, both multiple products and multiple inputs into their uh, renewable fuel plants. So bringing on board manures, incorporating wind power, um, incorporating a biogas. Uh, plan and try and bring the, the whole concept of biorefinery together with the local agricultural uh, practices um, and also bring in hydrogen um, there as well. So, as, as with um, a lot of discussion um, in uh, fuel production and, and hitting net zero, we, we talk about carbon um, carbon capture, and it's generally associated with um, large bioenergy plants producing electricity. But it, uh, actually, um, it's applicable to all um, biorefineries, and I think it will be an increasingly um, considered aspect of biorefinery location. Um, so the only real example um, in the world at the moment of uh, bioenergy carbon capture and storage is based on an ethanol plant um, in the US. So the ethanol that's produced during um, sugar fermentation, sorry, the carbon dioxide uh, produced uh, during sugar fermentation to ethanol is captured um, and stored, um, um, sequestered underground. Um, the same company, ADM, is also, is also investing uh, and partnering in the building of a carbon uh, dioxide pipeline uh, to link its refineries uh, together with uh, storage uh, facilities. Um, so that's it's that's great. Um, negative emissions obviously um, are not a bad a bad thing, but there's potentially a lot more that we can do with carbon dioxide rather than just store it um, under, under the ground. So and this is where the hydrogen integration with biorefinery operation comes into comes into play. Um, so with decreasing price of hydrogen production, electrolyzer price going down year on year, there's more potential to produce uh, lower cost hydrogen. Uh, combine that with a clean source of carbon dioxide, which you often get from biorefinery operation, we can then start to thinking about producing other products such as uh, methanol from reverse water shift uh, reactions and fissure troughs, but also biotechnology as well, using a source of hydrogen fermentation with, with CO2 to make um, many things from single cell protein to, to chemicals. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to take the carbon dioxide byproduct from refineries and in turn turn that into uh, further products. One um, final element is this idea of do biorefineries need to be uh, built from scratch with all that capital uh, investment, the hundreds of millions of, of dollars worth of investment? Um, or po possibly, possibly not. So one of the things we've seen in the last three to four years is the use of mass balance um, 
for uh, the production of either mass balanced or bioattributed um, products. So this is where an existing chemical complex takes a, a portion of biomass into its facility and co-processes it with fossil feedstocks, um, uses a, um, a bookkeeping approach to track uh, that biomass uh, material through the refinery, but then allocate it to specific products. So the biobased carbon doesn't necessarily end up in the product that you're selling as bioattributed. It's a little bit like uh, green electricity. Uh, you might be on a green electricity tariff, but you're not necessarily receiving renewable electrons um, when you draw electricity from, from the grid. And this works in the same way. But what it does allow is the markets that have got an interest in um, bio-based um, products to allocate a favourable price to those products by placing the biogenic fraction of the input onto a specific product in, in the output, even though that in the real world those carbon molecules have been spread across a white portfolio of products. And this is where the BiNAPFA that we talked about earlier on in the presentation from UPM, but also from um, Neste has been taken up by large chemical companies such as BSF um, and Borealis to make um, an old range of products. And there's a few examples there like polypropylene, polyethylene, PVC, but it really could be anything that comes out of a petrochemical uh, complex or, or refinery. So just some final thoughts um, there. Um, bar refineries, they're not um, new. Um, there might be new innovation and new new evolution, but bar refineries have been around for hundreds of years. We've just given them a new a new name. What we'll see increasingly is incorporation of other renewables onto bar refinery um, sites. Um, and we need to look at where hydrogen fits in with that and the potential to use that carbon dioxide. But there's a big scale question here, as we said earlier on, biorefineries are considerably smaller than petrochemical uh, complexes. So where will we use those CO2 um, off gases? Uh, will they be on the original biorefinery site or will they be at an end of a pipeline which consolidates multiple uh, CO2 outputs into one much larger uh, facilities. Um, we've seen a big trend towards mass balancing and the use of existing uh, petrochemical complex infrastructure for making bioattributed products, but the specific type of feedstock that's required there, the, the bionapfa, that is limited to processing or largely limited to processing of vegetable oils, which is a, uh, a pretty constrained resource. So there's a big question about how large or what volume of material can come from that type, that type of processing. Um, so I think that was a, a quick uh, review of some of the, um, the developments around biorefineries, and, and I'm happy to take um, any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Adrian. Uh, very interesting, and this is this is the subject which is very close to my heart. So I have been working um, on biorefinery since uh, 2004, uh, since basically beginning of my um, academic career. So it's really interesting to see uh, the developed, fully uh, kind of almost like scaled up biorefineries working all over the world, but nothing much happening in the UK. <laughs> Is it? Or... Um, not as much as I would like to see. That that's that that's for sure. I mean, we so we do have some historic fire refineries processing starch. Uh, we we are now processing used vegetable oil, so we're producing on the Humber sustainable aviation fuel. Um, so we do have some. Sorry. <laughs> yes, we we do um, have a small amount of activity, not as much as I would like. I would like to see. Um, so we have some established traditional starch refineries. Of course, we've got the sugar, four sugar factories, um, producing 
multiple outputs. I mean, the largest one, the Whisington produces um, betaine, produces ethanol, produces various sugar, sugar grades, um, inorganics um, as well. Um, on the Humber, Philips 66 is now producing sustainable aviation fuel. So they're processing used uh, cooking oils, hydrotreating. So there's little pockets of activity, but nothing I would say, um, not as much as there should be or could be. And of course, we have a, a nice butanol demonstration plant as well. I should I should say that it's not all fuel uh, and starch production. We have butanol production at demonstration level on Grange Mouth with Celtic renewables. Yeah, um, do it, I, I see biorefineries are kind of uh, very disparate activities not really coordinated or uh, kind of, you know, it, it's embedded within uh, energy plan, renewable energy plan. The reason is uh, because we have limited resources and very limited carbon, um, carbon efficient resources like biomass, that's the only carbon efficient resources to fossil based resources. So we need to actually, you know, think of uh, prioritizing like, OK, let's let's tackle fine chemicals first, decarbonize fine chemicals, then platform chemicals and, and so on, and then specialty chemical, then platform chemicals, then materials or, or some sort of, you know, coordinated activities around. Um, not sure, maybe in the UK region or, or something where uh, we could say, OK, net zero is our target, but um, we do not have the kind of plan which is uh, our policy with, which cuts across different sectors. Yeah, um, policies, have, as you said, have been around energy um, production, um, whether that be electricity, heat or liquid liquid fuels. Um, and what's happened in the materials chemical space has been on the back of um, novel product development and companies like Unilever um, looking to respond to consumer pull for more sustainable ingredients and products. And that's um, really pushed that evolution around chemicals, UPM, for example, and some of the things that NatureWorks and Cargill have done around lactic acid uh, and PLA. Um, In the, from the UK, the government, you probably know, is working on a biomass strategy. Um, in that biomass strategy, there will be um, some consideration of chemical and material production alongside, alongside energy. Um, partly, we need more environmental impact data on chemicals. Um, because for policymakers, it's a question of impact, and that impact comes from scale. Um, so they want to see large reductions in emissions, which requires large volumes of materials um, to be to be produced. Um, the fact that those commodity chemicals are actually made at quite large scale is the bit of the jigsaw. I think policy people are missing. Um, it doesn't matter how big the energy market is, you've only got a certain amount of biomass. Um, yeah. Nobody even suggests replacing our fossil consumption with um, biomass feedstocks because there isn't enough biomass feedstocks. Mm -hmm. So it's not a question of how ultimately how big that market is. It's just making sure that the market and the facilities are the right scale in chemicals, which is 100,000, 200,000, maybe 300,000 tonnes. We're not going to process more biomass at a single facility or very unlikely. And th those scales do fit commodity chemicals. So it's just as practical to make ethanol for fuel as it is to make ethanol for polyethylene, for example. So we need more thinking around, around best use of biomass. Um, yeah, so these operating companies at the moment who who have uh, who are owning this large scale biorefineries compared to but which are considered small for petrochemical refineries 
Nevertheless, do they have dedicated biomass supply facilities to guarantee that there will be available biomass or that's kind of third party ownership and how, yeah, then, how does then, the model work? Yeah, then they're not generally vertically integrated, so they wouldn't own the land and the biomass supply. That's contractual. Um, but in the same way that petrochemical complexes are often fed by third party NAP, for, for example, um, you wouldn't. Um, or, for example, Grangemouth is fed by LNG imports from, from the US. Um, so there's not a vertical integration across the board. It's a bit maybe different for some of the forest industries that they will have some of their own forestry um, supply, but often it's con it's through contract. But what is important that they have secured supply. So the, you know, if you're spending 500 million pounds plus um, on a biorefinery, you're absolutely sure and your investors are absolutely sure that there's the feedstock to supply that uh, refinery and you've got the legal uh, where we've been to enforce that supply. Yeah, um, there may be 30 years down the line, a supply inter interruption. Um, and it's one advantage probably of working in the forest industry that you know over a long time span where the material's coming from because of the nature of forestry. Um, what we harvest today was planted 30, 40 years ago. Um, so you, you've got a long, a long outlook on forestry supply, which is a little bit different to agriculture. Let's look at the chat if there are questions. Angie. Yeah, there was one from Thomas. Thomas was looking at, are there any gaps in evidence that need to be plugged from the biomass, biogas sector? Um, he's talking about credible data is needed to underpin the public and political confidence, which is critical to assuring LCAs are mm. of use by, by many agencies. I don't, I, uh, Thomas I might be able to explain a little bit more about that. I don't know if he can go on speaker. I know he's got a particular interest in that. Maybe not, but you see where it's coming from. He's trying to get a more well, standardized way of doing. Yeah, that. I mean, this certain. I mean, the, the advantage of the fuel producers is the the methodology, rightly or wrongly, the me the methodology for measuring the green greenhouse gas, the footprint, the carbon footprint, is laid down in in legislation. So. Everybody's using the same method, the same system. They have no choice. It's what the legislation says they have to, they have to do. The material sector, yes, it, it will follow ISO. It will follow correct procedures for LCA, but there's lots of decision making within an LCA. Um, and it's not harmonized. And so um, you do get um, different results perfectly valid results, but different results from the way that people have undertaken uh, their LCA. So for chemicals and materials, there is a definite lack of harmonization. And it, it does, it raises questions with um, policy makers when they see what they think is the same process giving different results. And you have to explain where the differences lie, why the differences are valid, um, but it still it causes um, a little bit extra complexity. There was a further question here from Tola Lope, who was talking about: um, Are there any large-scale utilization of agricultural waste as part of a biorefinery? Um, well, certainly those lignocellulose and ethanol plants are focused on agricultural residues. So in the US, corn stover. If it's in Europe, it may be stover, but it could also be wheat, wheat straw. Um, there is, I'm not quite sure the development status, um, but there is rice straw um, plant. Uh, somewhere in in Asia, I can't I can't remember. Um, and in India, it's it's not built yet, but there are plans for a bamboo 
um, refinery as well, but I don't, I'm not quite sure. It's not, I'm not sure it's financed um, yet. So yes, agricultural residues, intercellulosic ethanol has always been, has always been the plan. Um, in Brazil, it's not an agricultural residue, it's a process byproduct in the bagasse. Um, so those rising projects integrate, uh, their business model integrate um, sugarcane, sugar to ethanol with the gas to ethanol processes. So whereas maybe a few years ago you had a, a sugarcane process that will have used the bagasse for cogeneration, for heat and power generation, raising a process in that bagasse to ethanol and increasing the ethanol output from a refinery. Because, of course, once you're past the fermentation, distillation is quite an expensive part of ethanol production, but you can combine both parts of ethanol in the same business units and increase the refinery throughput, which improves payback. So that's their business model to combine biogas ferment, processing and fermentation with um, sugarcane sugar processing. I thought some of the ethanol plants that you talked about where they were producing like a, a say a bioethanol and a a, a feed a, a food stuff that must be quite different from the the fossil fuel um model in terms of you're producing you you talked about the difficulty of developing markets and supply chains and things like that you know they're two completely different things going to two complete I mean that must be a, a real yeah. challenge obviously Cargill I suppose has a bit of weight but it's still yeah, it's it, it's if depending on where your origins are. So if you're British Sugar, which um, ran, um, they were part of the the Humber, the Virgo refinery. So ABF Associated British Foods, I suppose they had a neat market opportunity because that was BP and ABF. So BP ethanol to the fuel, Associated British Fuels, the DDGS into the animal market. Ensis, on the other hand, didn't have that same view of the animal feed market for the DDS. And for it, somebody coming from the chemical industry, um, it is two very different stakeholder groups uh, working with um, the agricultural value chain for animal feed and working with a fuel value chain for the ethanol. Um, and it's those kind of complexities that we should never lose sight of the need to bring different groups, different industries with different viewpoints on what different sustainability arguments actually are. And often you, you see this, particularly in development countries, a lot of the work of the RSB is around smallholders and bringing smallholders and small plantation operators into a system that works for them, not just a large centralised biorefinery, but making sure that the supply chains are equitable for small stakeholders and compliance with sustainability measurement and certification is also practical for smallholders. Um, you know, it's easy for a very large company with thousands and thousands of hectares of, of land, or tens of thousands of hectares to comply sometimes with certification things. But if you're a, a farmer level or a smallholder level, it's a different kind of conversation. And are there existing models for that where you get that sort of the social element of it as well, going back down to producers? Yeah, it's, it's really a big focus of the RSB is around the equ equitable development of bioeconomy activities um, and ensuring that sm smallholders are integrated in the certification system. And then the challenge becomes who owns the carbon, because this is one of the issues that we're seeing right now with, in UK agriculture, where, you yeah. know, maybe a, a farming entity might be net zero. But if, let's say, one of their food producers wants to use them as scope three emissions, you know, wants to claim that carbon, that's going to be problematic. And maybe those small producers, for example, you know, need to have the economic value of that carbon in, in terms of LCA. Yeah, I think that's got, it's going to take a bit of time to work through that ownership um, of carbon when you start talking about who's claiming the scope two, the scope three, as we get more integrated in things, who's going to claim the CO2 if it's put in a CO2 pipeline? 
is it is it the, the original producer of that biogenic CO2 or is it the user of that CO2 and how's that accounted for within uh, within the LCA system? Yeah. And I have a question here, which I asked, which with regard to the Yara plant turning AD into um, biogas into green ammonia and hydrogen, I mean, it, it might be just me, but this seems like a really roundabout way about going like this. And I'm wondering if it's sort of driven by the sort of the LCA, the science or, or the economics, because sometimes we'll get really strange numbers coming out of these because of local economic conditions. Yeah, I, can, I can't give you the answer to that, but I think there's there's more thinking to be done around methane and hydrogen and how, you know, it really comes outside of the ammonia bit, it a little bit comes down to how we feel about the use of, of carbon. Is are, are we pure, is our policy purely to bury as much carbon as we possibly can from wherever we can find carbon? Um, and I, I, have, I have a conf concern that to a, at, some, at some point in time, we're going to be burying biogenic carbon to mine fossil carbon in the name of Z, net zero. Uh, and it can make no sense. Um, we're going to need, if if you take the premise that we cannot use fossil carbon, we're going to need all the carbon we've got in the world, whether it be recycled carbon from the existing economy, um, biogenic carbon or atmospheric carbon, we're going to need all that carbon. We, shouldn't, we won't be burying any of it. We're going to need it all. Um, but that's still a debate, I think, of where what we should be doing with that that carbon and that place that should we be turning biomethane into hydrogen and burying the carbon and then have a net net negative or negative hydrogen in that scenario. Because certainly you important... mentioned. Sorry. sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I, 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 yeah. yeah, it's basically this is an important point, Adrian. Uh, you touched upon that uh, all the carbon we need. Considering the recycled carbon, uh, we are using, you know, materials uh, after after their life we are using back. That would also have fossil uh, carbon footprint. So they are mm -hmm. not fossil free. So when we are talking no. about fossil free, entirely on biomass, I think will fall far short. And that's where the um, planetary boundary uh, comes into picture that we have really transgressed those boundaries that we do not have enough biogenic carbon as such to um, support all the product needs. Yeah, yeah, no, ab ab absolutely. Um, it's why you need multiple uh, approaches to all of this. We need, need to squeeze the size of the economy because it's too big. Yeah. We need to make sure whatever we've already mined and that whether, whether it's biogenic mined or whether it's fossil mined, um, we need to make sure we continue using it, which is where the circular bit comes into play uh, and we know that nothing's circular forever so where is that other carbon and it, it's Unilever's rainbow carbon rainbow you know it's can we get it from the atmosphere well yes but it's expensive can we get it from the biosphere yes but we need to be careful because there's impacts uh, of doing of doing that um, so we're going to need all those bits of carbon um, the key is to eliminate the mining of fossil because I think I think James said it Taking things from out of the ground and putting them in the atmosphere is a bad idea. Yeah. Sorry, Angie, I uh, interrupted you. Um, I no, that's can't. that's okay. I was just sort of, I was just sort of, because I was, I wanted to ex exactly explore what Adrian had said about that. Bearing in mind that he only gave us one example, and I'm sure you're right. There's of uh, bioenergy, carbon capture, and storage, and yet Beck seems to be one of those really big buzzwords that that policymakers like because they're going quick let's just get that carbon down into the ground and rather than that utilization argument first yeah yeah it's it's the question around net net zero is fine but how much should the negative be and how much should the positive be that's that's debatable okay uh, thank you very much, Adrian, uh, for giving very insightful uh, and important uh, speech today for EBNet. We much appreciate that. And thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you.
So our final speaker um, today, we move on to the our final speaker now, is uh, Dr. Uh, Siddharth Gadkari. Siddharth is a lecturer in the Department of Chemical and uh, Process Engineering at the University of Surrey. His work in the past eight years has uh, focused on optimization of advanced bioenergy technologies, converting renewable and waste resources to energy, fuels, and chemicals through catalytic, thermochemical, biochemical, and bioelectrochemical routes. Through his academic research and industry experience, Siddharth has developed a unique set of skills that lie at the interface between computational modeling and experimentation in the domain of waste valorization. His uh, group's priority is to conduct rigorous, meaningful, and impactful analysis to develop sustainable technologies for an effective transition to circular economy. The speech he is going to give is on um, carbon capture and utilization using microbial electrosynthesis. Uh, and is it truly sustainable? Uh, thanks, Sid. Over to you. All right. Uh, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, and thank you, Juma, for inviting me for this uh, talk. Uh, I, unlike the previous um, talk, I'm going to focus more uh, specifically on one technology uh, and not a general overview of all the other technologies, but like more specific technology called as microbial electrosynthesis. Um, so uh, for those who are not familiar with this technology, uh, microbial electrosynthesis, it is a um, it is a type of a bioelectrochemical system. So by bioelectrochemical, we mean uh, it is like a electrochemical cell, uh, something like a fuel cell, uh, like a common fuel cell, which has anode and cathode um, uh, electrodes. Uh, what makes it bio is basically we have uh, a biofilm uh, which catalyzes the reaction at one of the electrodes. So it, so uh, like in this case, in microbial electrosynthesis, typically the biofilm is at the cathode, which makes it uh, biocathode. And that catalyzes the reduction reaction, uh, which is occurring in the cathode chamber. So that makes it bioelectrochemical system. Um, so uh, what typically happens is we send um, water or wastewater at the anode in the anode compartment of this electrochemical cell and water oxidizes or there is water splitting essentially into oxygen, uh, protons and electrons. Um, the protons, they can travel through the membrane towards the cathode side, whereas the electrons, they travel in the external circuit uh, towards the cathode. On the cathode side, um, we can send in CO2 which is which has been captured from uh, from some uh, uh, from industry from some industry or from some uh, process plant. Uh, so this uh, CO2 that can be sent into the cathode chamber. Here it can react with the protons and the electrons and can be catalyzed using the biofilm, which is uh, composed of different types of bacteria basically, and depending on the type of bacteria that we employ in the in the cathode chamber we can select uh, the type of product that is formed like in this particular case it is acetic acid which is one of the most popular products in microbial electrosynthesis uh, but the similar technique can be used for um, convert basically carbon capture and utilization uh, into different types of carboxylic acids like formic acid butyric acid succinic acid uh, and even uh, fuels like methane. So uh, now a uh, lot of focus is also on if we use acetogenic bacteria in the cathode chamber, we can also use this technology for biogas upgrading. Uh, so we, we can send the biogas in, instead of just pure CO2 and the biogas is composed of CO2 and CH4. So the CO2 fraction can be converted to CH4 and that way we can upgrade the biogas and increase its calorific value. Uh, but in this particular uh, uh, study, we have focused it on uh, one of the most popular product of microbial electrosynthesis, which is um, acetic acid. 
Uh, now, typically this reaction between um, and the anode and cathode, the standard cell potential is negative, uh, which means the reaction is not spontaneous. And that is why external energy or external power has to be supplied to this uh, for this reaction to occur. And this can be uh, supplied from a renewable source uh, and like solar or wind power. So this essentially also acts as a as a store uh, for the renewable energy, the additional renewable electricity which is generated because we all know the renewable are intermittent they have intermittent supply so sometimes we will have access of it and then we will have to store it somewhere so this also acts as a very good uh, storage because chemical bonds are uh, of chemical compounds they are quite sturdy so it is it also acts as a very good storage for excess sort of renewable electricity uh, so uh, in this particular work, uh, we have focused it on uh, microbial electrosynthesis, the uh, life cycle assessment of microbial electrosynthesis, uh, specifically for one product that is acetic acid, which is one of the most uh, common product which has been uh, uh, which has been produced using MES technology. Uh, so acetic acid is a very common commodity chemical, has many uses and um, therefore, and a the, uh, lot of the bacteria basically uh, that are uh, electroactive, which can be easily used in the in the cathode compartment biofilm, they also sort of produce acetic acid. So that is why it has become like the most common sort of product from uh, this technology. So we wanted to essentially study, uh, conduct a detailed life cycle assessment of this process, uh, which has been, which is being seen as a very promising technology for uh, carbon capture and utilization and uh, for production of biochemicals like uh, I have just shown acetic acid. Uh, so we wanted to see the if the if the process specifically for acetic acid, um, which is uh, very very difficult. I mean, to um, to separate the downstream processing of acetic dilute acetic acid is quite difficult. Uh, so we wanted to understand whether this technology, the, the product which is obtained from this technology, is it comparable anywhere near to fossil based sort of production at this point and in future sort of. Uh, so this is like a schematic of the of the whole plant that we have considered. Uh, so we have we will have uh, we have a stack of MES reactors for representation. We are only showing one. But there is a stack of MES reactors and we send in the analyte and the catholyte. Um, uh, electric supply it can be both uh, the grid supply or the renewable uh, electricity. And uh, the dilute product which is obtained from the cathode bio cathode chamber is sent for uh, separation and extraction to form the pure acetic acid. Uh, so in this particular scheme, we have chosen an extractive distillation as the process for downstream processing. And then uh, the CO2 which is sent into the cathode chamber, it is assumed that we are ca uh, capturing it from an industrial uh, plant, uh, from an industry. And uh, so the environmental impact associated with the separation and compression of CO2 and transportation to the plant is also being accounted. Uh, so this is the this was the LCA methodology which was followed on this study. Our goal was to understand the potential environmental impacts and benefits of acetic acid production via MES. And the scope. Uh, uh, so uh, the scope of the LCA spans from the um, uh, cradle uh, that is starting from raw material extraction to the production gate. That is, uh, we stop at the production gate uh, of acetic acid and we do not consider the end of life disposal element of uh, basically the use and end of life uh, for this particular chemical. Uh, see, do we can't uh, see your slides. Oh, OK, sorry. I think it got. 
Oh, I, I stopped sharing for some. Yeah. Can you see now? Yeah. OK. Um, the functional unit. Uh, that uh, the functional unit that we uh, chose to work with in this particular study was about 100. 1000 tons per year of acetic acid production using this process. And then uh, a few different scenarios were studied to compare the acetic acid production. Uh, so this is like a, a general inventory of the different uh, uh, materials and chemicals and energy that was used into the process. Uh, so like for anode, uh, we have used the, the typical, well, the most common one which is used is graphite material. And for cathode, uh, we have actually compared for two different types of cathode, the carbon felt electrode and the 3D graphene functionalized carbon felt, which has which gives higher performance. Um, and uh, the, there is a membrane ion exchange membrane in between, which is considered which we have used the most common one, which is ne uh, And And the, then we also included the other chemicals for analyte and catholyte and the electricity and uh, steam. Um, the inventory also includes the uh, CO2 capture and uh, CO2 capture comp uh, compression and transportation to the plant. Uh, so uh, based on our analysis, based on this inventory and, uh, and our analysis, we then uh, essentially we, we ran the first scenario, which was for continuous mode operation uh, with, with complete electricity. If, uh, with the whole electricity requirement, which was uh, rec uh, which was required in the plant to be supplied from the grid. And we looked at two very important impact categories. Um, uh, instead of focusing on a lot of other lo lot of impact like eutrophication potential and everything else, we just wanted to get the basics correct. Uh, so we wanted to focus specifically on two impact categories. Uh, at the start, uh, and the two that we have selected is, is uh, were greenhouse gas emissions uh, (kgCO2) equivalent per k, uh, kg of acetic acid, and the second was uh, non-renewable energy use, uh, that is in megajoules per kg of acetic acid, um, and this was our result from the analysis. So uh, when all the electricity uh, that is required in the plant is is used um, is is uh, taken from the grid. We we get about twelve uh, uh, around twelve kg of CO two equivalent per kg of acetic acid, and about two hundred and twenty uh, megajoules of acetic uh, non renewable energy is used uh, for, uh, per kg of acetic acid. Uh, now this result without Comparison doesn't mean anything, so we had to compare it with fossil based uh, acetic acid production. So we, we chose the most standard. Uh, uh, me method that is used for producing acetic acid uh, on an industrial scale. And based on based on that, the current. Uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions which are required per kg of acetic acid is uh, significantly low uh, for a uh, fossil based acetic acid production. It is a bit around 1.5 and uh, the energy requirement, uh, non renewable energy requirement is also quite quite low around only around 40 megajoules. So. Um, we can we can see that um, based on based on just the results. Um, that. The continuous mode operation uh, of MES does is definitely does not look sustainable compared to the fossil based approach as as of now. And uh, large part of this result is because of um, because of distillation, because of because of uh, ex excessive energy consumption in the. Uh, in the downstream processing, basically to separate out the dilute product to make it concentrated. And um, so that is where maximum 80% of energy is essentially just going into the uh, 
downstream processing of this product. And this is what leads to such high greenhouse gas emissions and non-renewable energy use compared to uh, the standard fossil based method. Um, like as I mentioned before, uh, one of the um, MES is also being seen as one of the technologies for uh, approach uh, for uh, storing renewable electricity. So if instead of uh, up, uh, instead of taking electricity from grid, if if all the electricity requirement of the plant, uh, this thousand ton per acetic acid per year plant was taken from renewable electricity, uh, then the requirement immediately falls down um, and becomes very much comparable to the fossil based acetic acid production. So this is the result of scenario two, as you can see here in this slide. Um, this is almost very similar to, in fact, actually slightly lower um, than fossil based acetic acid production. Um, one problem with this approach is the, the use of renewable electricity because the amount of renewable electricity that will be required is uh, is extremely high and that will essentially require setting up a photovoltaic plant um, or, a, or, a, or a windmill essentially next to this acetic acid plant. And, and it has to supply the renewable electricity throughout the year. Um, at the same rate. And so that is one of the biggest um, sort of shortcoming that we realized. I mean, even though it looks like it, it will achieve uh, a lower greenhouse gas emissions and lower energy use uh, compared to fossil based approach. Uh, practically, it will not really be feasible. Um, uh, uh, unless the price of electricity, renewable electricity and the development of photovoltaic plants or setting up of those photovoltaic plants becomes uh, extremely cheap. Uh, this will not really be practical um, at this stage. Uh, then other than also continuous mode operation, um, we also looked at um, uh, fed, fed batch mode operation because that is more common in MES as of now than uh, uh, the continuous mode of operation. And of course, that requires slightly more number of uh, reactors uh, compared to the continuous mode. And But the results are very, very much similar. As you can see for scenario three, where if we use a, um, electricity from grid, and in scenario four, if we use the uh, electricity, renewable electricity for the um, uh, keeping all the other conditions same and just changing it to fed batch mode. Uh, we just see a slight increase from 11.80 to 12.30. And a slight, in, slight increase in greenhouse gas emissions from 1.31 to 1.81. And similarly for uh, non-renewable energy use as well. And how all of these compare to uh, the fossil based system? Uh, as, as I mentioned, it is uh, the the scenario two that is the continuous mode operation with all the electricity supplied from a renewable uh, source. Uh, it has comparable uh, greenhouse gas emissions and lower actually lower non renewable energy use. So it is slightly better, but again, the the the, the main drawback being use of use of uh, renewable electricity and so much of renewable electricity for for one plant. And that will always be uh, an economical challenge. So uh, the final conclusions from this study were basically we were trying to understand whether uh, the technology which is being promoted or uh, looked at as a very promising alternative for uh, biochemical production, whether it is really sustainable or not. And it is a very important question before before any kind of investment uh, has to be made. So um, we, uh, from our study, we have seen that at least at, 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 this, at this point, it is not really sustainable unless we can find out some very cheap uh, 
both in terms of price and energy, a cheap ways of uh, extracting uh, acetic acid from the dilute product, which is obtained from MES. So unless we can find that at this point, it is not possible. Uh, so we also try to calculate what is the threshold value of minimum production rate because uh, everything depends on the production rate of MES and the product titer which is obtained from this particular process uh, because that goes into the downstream processing and then that determines the energy requirement. So we wanted to calculate what is the threshold value of minimum production rate that is required which will have equivalent or lower environmental impact compared to fossil based production process. Um, and from uh, an LCA point of view, we have seen that this number, the threshold value of production rate uh, should be around 4100 gram per meter square per day. Uh, so this is the kind of uh, uh, in a fed batch mode. So this is the kind of production rate which is required. Whereas if you see the best reported uh, sort of production rate right now from MES uh, has been around 700, like 685 gram per meter square per day. So, uh, I mean, looking at this, the, uh, the number, the, the threshold required is about seven times higher, uh, six to seven times higher. And th at this point, certainly it, it doesn't look very uh, feasible or sustainable. So this was our main conclusion, uh, but the, the purpose of this study was not really to dissuade people who are working on MES for acetic acid production or using as, uh, MES for other um, chemical production, but it's, it's essentially to redirect focus into specific areas where a dilute sort of acetic acid product can could be used, like as we have seen in previous um, talk as well. Uh, so it is essential to redirect product um, from one sort of process into other process. So uh, processes where a dilute acetic acid can be uh, is, re is a requirement. We can use MES definitely there uh, and it will still it will show a very good um, uh, sustainability or environmental profile because if we if we use the dilute product, we don't have to invest into downstream processing and distillation and, uh, and there's no energy requirement there, then the process will look much, much more sustainable compared to if we just use it for specific uh, chemical production. Like what uh, people are, are claiming right now. Uh, so this study is already published. Uh, we have published this um, actually last year uh, in RSC advances and number of people who are involved in this. Of course, Professor uh, Juma Sadukan, um, uh, along with Dr. Nabin Ariel, who is now uh, working as a faculty member in uh, Norway, in uh, southeastern Norway, and also Dr. Bezat. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, and acknowledge the support from the different research councils uh, from NERC and EPSRC for this work. Uh, and th uh, thanks a lot for your attentions. Uh, I'm happy to take uh, any questions if you have. Thank you very much, Sid. Uh, uh, very important presentation to convey some key points about hotspots and ways to mitigate them. So the floor is open for questions. We have one question in the chat. Um, oh, two questions actually. Uh, what is the concentration of acetic acid in the stream from uh, microbial electrosynthesis and fossil waste process respectively? If you have mm -hmm. the numbers in yeah. handy. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't remember it at the top of my head, but I mean, I will show you. Um, if uh, can you see the slide? Yep. Yeah, so uh, what we have assumed it is a, a space time yield uh, production from MES as 148 gram per liter per day. 
from the MES. Uh, this is not the final product title which comes, but this is the space time yield in the MES reactor. So this is assumed. Uh, so this is this has not been achieved by any MES reactor as of now. We have uh, only about what has been achieved is quite lower than this, but we have assumed this because uh, this is 148 gram per liter per day is the space time yield that has been observed in for acetogenesis. Uh, uh, no, sorry for uh, in a continuous for gas fermenter where CO2 and hydrogen has been used to um, uh, obtain acetic acid in a continuous gas fermenter and there they have obtained this 148 gram per liter per day. So this is like one of the best case scenarios of uh, using uh, bacteria to convert CO2 and uh, hydrogen into acetic acid. That is what we have considered in this, uh, but this is certainly not the no no study actually in MES has has achieved this rate. So again, th that drives our point that uh, still lot of research has to go into improving the productivity of MES. Uh, second question is uh, why is the production rate rather than concentration of acetic acid that significantly affects uh, extraction? Uh, yes, so uh, I'm not saying the concentration doesn't affect both. Both affect it is just the it is just the volume of the reactors that we consider that is where the uh, the production rate and uh, will play into more effect. Uh, but obviously the final concentration, as I have been mentioning, the pro final product titer is also significantly important. And that that is actually the final product concentration is what determines the the energy requirement in the downstream process. So it is equally important. Um, we have uh, another question. Thank you for an interesting talk. I wondered uh, for how long the biofilm on the cathode is viable. Uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, experimentally, people have studied uh, uh, much very long studies, like up to 10 months uh, or even like more than that for uh, what we know is 10 months. But even but there are studies which have worked on uh, these kind of bioelectrochemical systems with viable biofilms uh, much longer. Uh, why uh, this will not affect our analysis, the life cycle uh, assessment analysis, because we have not considered the impact of biofilm. We have not added uh, any impact associated with it. So we are considering it to be impact free or the impact is so low that it will not affect the final analysis. So it, it will not affect the LCA results in this analysis. Um. Okay. Did we not consider um, resource acquisition for uh, the for, for the, the biofilm biomass? Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, we no, we, no. we assumed okay, yeah. we assumed it to be uh, very low basically, hmm. and that is why we we it was an assumption of the study that uh, it is significantly low, so we do not need to consider. The environmental impact presented displays the immaturity of the technology on TRL level, technology readiness level. Is there any prototype developed of MES technology that gives uh, sustainable statistics? Uh, I am I'm not sure uh, if there is any uh, prototype uh, specifically for MES which has been developed. Uh, there, there, there are uh, prototypes uh, like large scale prototypes which have been developed for other bioelectrochemical systems like microbial fuel cells um, and microbial electrolysis cell also probably, uh, but for not MES. MES, uh, there is a st it is still at a very, very low TRL. And that is why the values that we have considered uh, in our analysis, we have, we have, we have considered a very, very uh, high efficiency values, but even then, um, the performance was not really up. I mean, cl uh, even close to the uh, fossil-based acetic acid production. Another question I missed beforehand was: uh, oh, What other resources can be recovered by wastewater treatment plants? 
other than uh, volatile fatty acids and extracting electricity by the technology. Uh, I think the so, metal. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, other than um, like obviously acids and electricity, there is also a possibility of metal recovery. So if we use metal laden wastewater into the cathode, uh, that uh, so the 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 metal ions can be reduced on the cathode uh, as well, and that can help to sort of uh, clean the metal uh, wastewater. Uh, additionally, as I mentioned, other than chemicals, uh, we uh, fuels are also being uh, can be generated like hydrogen and methane. And one of the uh, one of the key focus now is using MES for biogas upgradation. Um, basically converting the CO2 fraction in biogas to CH4 and it is being seen as a upgrading technology. And you also used, uh, you're also um, using this technology for biosensors, right? Oh yeah, uh, so we are also uh, looking into using uh, bioelectrochemical systems as a biosensor for BOD monitoring uh, purposes. So that is another use of this technology. So the technology looks uh, promising. Um, however, if uh, for, however for specific applications, I mean something like very dilute uh, solution, and there is no other technology to help uh, recovering the pollutants, uh, remedying the pollutants. Uh, but the pollutants need to be removed from environmental standpoint. Then this technology would be useful. There has been an increase in efficiency for uh, microbial electrosynthesis over the past few years. Can you see such systems becoming efficient through to stack up in the near future longer? Uh, yeah, so that, that is one of the things that we the 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 productivity that we assume or the efficiencies that we have assumed are already quite significant were quite significantly higher than what is what has been achieved so far in the past few years. Uh, and even then, we did not really see a very good environmental profile. Uh, so our main conclusion from the study was essentially to either find very uh, cheap alternative ways to separate acetic acid from the dilute product or use the dilute product itself into some other process and then utilize it to and then balance the overall environmental impact of the of the of using MES as a as one part of the puzzle. Uh, sorry, Juma, you are uh, muted. Uh, yeah, I was asking if there is any other question uh, from the uh, from the audience. Okay. Um, okay. Two other questions. Is your MES producing oxygen? Uh, yeah, oxygen. We just consider it to be dissolved in the on the anode side, um, and we are not. We have accounted for the oxygen which is produced, but it is not sort of. I mean, it is not changing anything in the results too much. Here is a uh, Yong Kyung Liu. Um, you want to speak up? Uh, we are concerned. Because, yeah, because uh, Liu is making a comment rather than a question. Okay. And we are concentrating uh, volatile fatty acid from dilute stream using FO membrane yeah. with low energy consumption. Oh yeah. So um, one of the one of the so there are several uh, areas in which uh, of of uh, essentially extracting uh, VFAs from dilute products, and one of the technology is is obviously membrane uh, that even we are like looking into thinking about it, and other technologies are resins, uh, uh, the use of resins as well. But uh, yes, uh, using of FO membrane as one low energy consumption uh, technology is definitely uh, and people uh, there are there have been some studies where um, 
some people are using membranes as a way of they are introducing a third chamber into into MES and then putting one additional membrane there to concentrate it. And I mean, definitely, I mean, if you are interested, we can we can talk about it more. Yeah, Leo is also commenting that uh, that could concentrate ten times more. Yeah, uh, that, 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 is, that is true. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. If there is no other question, thank you very much, um, Said, for giving this uh, important speech to the. Um, to the to this event, to this workshop. Uh, now I think uh, we'd. Uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So now I think we would uh, open the discussion forum to uh, anyone who would like to uh, speak anything, uh, any question, any problem that you are facing or anything you want to learn about life cycle assessment, uh, because in the panel we have life cycle assessment specialists, so we can uh, certainly advise you. It doesn't seem that uh, there is any problem or oh, Adrian is here. Hi, Adrian. James is here as well. So yeah, we would like to open up the, the forum for asking any question to our eminent speakers. If not, then we give a round of applause to our virtual applause mm -hmm. to our. Uh, oh, there, there are, are questions. questions. Yeah. Oh, they're typing up. OK. I am so bad at actually tracking the questions. Uh, sh shall I ask the question? Or? Yeah. Uh, um, hi, Adrian. Uh, this. I was wondering what your views are in the future of developing biorefineries using other feedstocks such as seaweeds in the UK. Yeah, seaweeds have been spoke about quite a lot over the last the last decade. Um, I think the challenge is, is scale. Um, scale of cultivation without um, damage, seabed damage or other biodiversity damage. So I think it's going to always be quite restricted on scale. So you're going to need a reasonably valuable output. There is um, obviously companies doing it. Not Nopla. Um, some of you may have heard the Earth Prize award last year or not Nopla, um, not PLA, Nopla uh, won, um, won, a, won a prize and they're using um, um, the um, um, Oh, the words, the words gone. They're using seaweed product as a barrier coating onto card and board packaging, um, as well as using um, seaweed to make the clear um, film material that was used a few years ago for the uh, marathon in London. So it's certainly, uh, it's got interesting applications, um, and I think it certainly will developed how large a scale it can develop on i'm not sure uh, we have done actually seaweed study and published the work in uh, green chemistry of the royal society of chemistry so we, we looked at um, we kind of graded the options and in a biorefinery context how what are the co-products that we can produce from seaweed um, and and obviously structural polysaccharides um, are the best to target for. Yeah, the, the, algae, they also, the alginates. Yeah. The alginates, yeah. And also the protein because they contain really high protein. So uh, amino, essential amino acids are the also the uh, choices of products. But if they if we want to also produce um, chemicals like succinic acid, lactic acid, levulinic acid, or uh, uh, furan dicarbox FDCA uh, two five furan dicarboxylic acid. Um, then we can produce we can extract sugar from the polysaccharides, but we compromise on the uh, structural polysaccharides bit. 
but energy containing polysaccharides we can use that via sugar platform and then produce those chemicals and they make quite economic sense certain parts of uh, the world uh, like like this this study we wanted to assess for mexico and it looks promising because uh, they have plenty of seaweed resources in mexico uh, but also other aspect is that uh, for food grade, uh, pharmaceutical grade ingredient productions, we do not, we, we can't use wild type seaweed. We have to use, we have to grow yeah. seaweed yeah, in yeah, controlled yeah. environment for high value productions. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's plenty of scope for high value controlled. Um, there's no doubt the materials are in, are interesting. It's it's the scale of sustainable cultivation, I think, that determines what you can and can't do. Yeah, true, because they contain a lot of water. 80% of it is basically water. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, volume of uh, all the process equipment would be quite yeah. big. Yeah, yeah. It's the, and the economics of harvest. There's lots of interesting work about integration with wind farm and, and, and long rope the development we did a project about seven eight years ago um but cultivation at sea mm. is, is tricky and you've really got to understand uh, marine engineering to develop develop that because it's very easy to lose a harvest to a storm yeah we have one hand up from your your girl Lou. Lou. How do I? Um... Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. I didn't realize that I can raise my hand. <laughs> you put the long sentences uh, quite slow for me. So I have the question to Adria. Uh, you know that for the bio refinery and is uh, from my you talk about uh, the holistic process and uh, feedstock is also very important. But when we look at the feedstock. Uh, actually, for biorefinery, fermenter, fermentation is a core, is a critical part. Also, the downstream separation extraction is so expensive. So, as far as you know, uh, as far as I know, that the basically fermentation is conducted in batch mode, and the productivity is uh, relatively low. So do you have any idea or as far as you know, do you think that there is a continuous fermentation in the industry and if there is a new development of the fermenter to improve the productivity and improve the concentration of the final products in the solution? Yeah, it was definitely continuous fermentation. That's definitely a, a huge focus, industry, industry focus. Um, which means strain development, a lot of work around strain development, because obviously the microbes that were going to be used are going to be recombinant and they've probably been um, engineered. So it has to be a robust strain that's not going to swap out during um, the fermentation um, run. But that's quite a bit of work going on in Nottingham around continuous fermentation. So that's one aspect of the productivity. And then of course, you've got the actual titer. So what can we do around toxicity? Um, so intracellular toxicity in making things like butanol, which is a fundamentally toxic uh, molecule or even worse, something like styrene. So moving towards continuous as opposed to batch fed, um, but also trying to engineer um, the strains to withstand toxic uh, chemical production. They're probably the two things that will change the process economics of the fermentation. OK, OK, thank you. And the downstream processing, of course, yes. And I think that's what we just saw. That's what Godari was talking about. If you've got to distill something like acetic acid, that's going to have a huge, a huge in impact on things and then it's probably a question of whether or not you do something um, around acid, whether it's a membrane separation for an acid or whether you need to esterify it or whatever, whatever you need for how to change the downstream process in a way from distilling how to distill molecules. 
yeah, I think there's a, a lot of the research is being done to improve the separation and extraction. In this case, actually, the LCA is quite important to help us to evaluate. Yeah. Because uh, when we develop a single technology, for example, membrane filtration, we say all oh, the energy consumption is quite low, but we didn't look at a holistic way, okay, from the membrane production, from the membrane cleaning, for the whole process, what is the energy consumption, what is the environmental impact from that uh, uh, separation. Yeah, in this case, uh, I think uh, from uh, the LCA is quite important to help us to to evaluate the different processes, the different technologies. Thank you. Yeah, uh, actually, just one of my students is also working on uh, forward osmosis membrane recovery of phosphorus, and we are looking into LCA of comparing it with respect to other uh, membrane based technologies uh, because forward osmosis is considered much lower energy low energy consuming sort of membrane process. So we yeah. are looking into that. Yeah, Yeah. currently one well, of my PhD students is working on the concentration of VFA from okay. the diluted stream. Uh, that is not the low energy intensity, but also the much lower fouling intensity. Yeah, much lower fouling. Yeah. Other membrane microfiltration, microfiltration RO. Yeah. But it is still in the research stage. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Forward osmosis still has to go. Yeah. I could see one question uh, for Adrian. Um, what are your views on economic allocation in uh, life cycle assessment for sugar biorefineries compared to other allocation methods, mass total recoverable um, sugars? Given that there is a lot of price volatility in its own price and its various products uh, prices, uh, ethanol, bioethylene, ethylene oxide, etc. All of allocation methods, um, I've always probably taken the view that I would prefer price as as opposed to energy or, or mass allocation purely physical, just on a polluter pays principle. Um, but obviously the price volatility, you can't get around the prices of products change over time. So your relative allocation will change um, um, with it. Um, I guess I'd be interested in what James thought to that question as well. Yeah, yeah I mean, allocation is an age old question in, in life cycle assessment. Uh, and ultimately it's trying to find a proxy for why something is taking place uh, and in the modern capitalist society uh, price and the economic revenue generation associated with the process tends to be the driver of, of why something is happening uh, but like you say price volatility can mean the numbers can change but ultimately it's uh, with all these things it's it's trying to understand that underpinning sort of cause and effect mechanism uh, and for in, in most cases economic is the best proxy we have for that yeah, we often do. Uh, actually, we often do uh, all of them to have yeah, clarity we, we, and we to have, have transparency. Yeah. yeah, yeah, agree. Um, there, there is a question on um, on life cycle assessment kind of course, and I could not resist myself um, from promoting my uh, <laughs> my module. Uh, and you can find the URL on the chat and we will run this module on um, intensive week basis. So it would be run over one week and that would be end of March uh, of 2023. Uh, so you could come along to this uh, course, to this module, how to do life cycle assessment. And we use uh, Pro. Uh, and it includes the hands-on training on CIMAP Pro. Are there any other questions that I have missed? No? Okay. All right. So if there is no other question, we give a round of applause. Let me find if I can find the virtual clapping thingy. And yes, 
to all our eminent speakers for uh, joining today and making useful contributions. Many thanks.